Um, and so we will call the regional school committee to order. Uh, we have a remote participant, so we will go around and say present. Tillman? Tillman present. Uh, Deb? Deb present. Bridget? Bridget present. Sarah? Sarah present. Jennifer? Present. William? Present. Anna? Present. Uh, Irv? Present. And Sarah Bess? Uh, present. So the regional school committee is called to order at 6.32. Um, Irv, do you want to call Union 26? Union 26. Uh, Bridget? Present. Sarah <coughs> Marshall? Present. Irv Rhodes? Present. Um, Sarah Bess? Present. William? Present. Margaret? Uh, not here. And absent. So we're called to order. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our first is an uh, update from the SNS about the final membership of the search committee. Thanks, Jennifer. So this is a brief update. So the finalized list of the search committee members has been posted on the ARPS website. It's at arps.org slash SUPT search. That's the page where all information about the superintendent search will be shared with the public. Of the original 20 people in the recommendation memo, two declined, and they happen to be both be people who were the only representative in the 20 in one category. So the SNS met and randomly selected people to fill those slots. And one of them happened to be me, so I am now a member of the search committee. And in addition, um, after our last meeting, we received an email from UFCW, from our one of our UFC, uh, uh, an employee who is a member or leader on UFCW, saying, oh, hey, we heard you need someone from UFCW, myself or, or this other person can, can, can serve on the search committee. And, you know, we had contacted them and let them know about this, the in search committee interest form, and they didn't uh, fill it out. But the SNS discussed it, and we figured, you know, considering all things, we do want someone from UFCW on the committee. So we decided to randomly select one of the two, and we selected one, and she did accept. So we decided to expand the search committee to 21 people. So those names are, are published on the, on the web page. So Sarah Marshall, as the appointed co-chair, has set the first meeting of the search committee for this Saturday, which is very exciting. And I expect any future updates about the search committee will come from the co-chair. So the SNS has not disbanded, but we've completed our initial work. And my suggestion is to leave the committee intact for now. We don't have any meetings scheduled. But when we get to the point where um, we have finalists, when the search committee you know, hands over finalists, Perhaps at that point, the joint committees might ask the SNS to develop or plan or design a process for how to, how to bring it, like how, what that will look like, bringing in the finalists, doing site visits, doing community sessions, uh, school committees, interviews, et, et cetera. So perhaps the SNS could be tasked with that. Um, that can be a topic for a future meeting. So the job posting is set to be open until February 22nd. Um, so that's, that's still open for a couple weeks. At the February 27th meeting of the joint committees, McPherson and Jacobson will present the summary of the input gathered from the many community input sessions that were held. So they're working on that right now. That's basically it. Awesome. <clears throat> Are there any questions? No. Okay. That was really fast. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so if that's the only update, <laughs> Irv? Then we can adjourn. <laughs> so, um, can I have a motion to adjourn? I'm, go ahead. I move we adjourn Union 26. And I'll second that. All right, it's been moved and second. Uh, so, roll call Bert, vote, uh, Bridget. Yes. Sarah. Aye. Irv. Aye. Sarah Bess. Aye. William. Aye. Margaret's absence, so it's unanimous. We're, we are adjourned. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I have to do the screen again, so I'm going to apologize ahead of time for not being very good at it. Okay. Um, I don't have a chair's update. Uh, oh, that's not true. Uh, so from the last couple of meetings, there have been some requests about um, restorative justice. And so we're working on 
having someone like putting together a time for someone to come and talk to us about the whole thing. So it's it not scheduled yet, but it is in the works. Um, okay. I yeah. have a question. I know I don't have an update, but I have a question for the chair. Sure. Yes. Um, did you receive any communication from the Hurricane Boosters about their fundraising for the track and field project? Not as a chair. Okay. Be well, because as the, the, the regional school committee received an email from a constituent who forwarded an email from the boosters saying that the boosters had informed the RSC that they will no longer be leading the fundraising efforts. So I wasn't sure if they had contacted you or if they, that they hadn't. Okay. Well, they, excuse me, they said as much when they were here. They did. Yeah. yeah. They, so they did, but they, but they, uh, they, okay, just thank checking. you. I'm just, just I, I just yeah. wanted to see they if they had confirmed. Again. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you. Um, okay. School committee announcement. Sarah? Uh, just that, uh, see, Deb Leonard and I both listened in to the Amherst Finance Committee meeting this afternoon, just as members of the public, that because they had um, the borrowing authorization for the track and field um, on their agenda, they didn't have much time. Um, but what they said uh, indicates, to me at least, that we that they are collecting questions. They have a lot of questions, and we'll be submitting those. I don't know to you, to Doug. Where is Doug? Doug. Uh, he is stuck in a meeting and is oh, coming very soon. No, he's not here. Yeah, um, and that I think those will be submitted in advance of the four towns meeting, and I think they will want to be discussing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They also plan to invite uh, school committee representatives to their next meeting, oh. which is two weeks from today, I believe. Great. And just we'll pipe in and say yeah. I also attended that oh. meeting. Oh, remotely, so. great. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't see. We can't see the yeah. attendees. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Were there any other school committee announcements? Oh, sorry, Coleman. Yeah. Just a quick note, since I'm the representative to the collaboration, uh, Collaborative for Educational Services, I want to note that they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, and they have a nice pamphlet about all the things they've done over the last 50 years, so I'll email that around to everyone just so you can see what they're doing. Great. Thank you. missing the attendance to the Shootsbury Finance Committee meeting who is going over budgets because they scheduled it on top of this one. So, oh. oh. <laughs> it's like right now? Yeah. Oh, like right now. That's <laughs> unfortunate. <Yeah. laughs> All right. But I don't think they're discussing our, mm. our stuff. Oh. No. They're, they're discussing the school budget mostly, I think. Yeah, that one last week. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so next up is to approve the minutes of January 23rd. Uh, Sarah? Do I make comments first or move and second it first? Move and second first. Oh, then, uh, okay, I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. And Any I discussion? <laughs> yes, I have a correction. Yep. Um, in section 2B, so under new business when we were discussing the um, the initial budget presentation. Um, it reports that I made a, asked a question about a 2% increase. What I said, I actually did not say percent, it was $2.6 million. Okay, so if you can correct percent to $2.6 million, thank you. Uh, Tillman? So under item E, I guess it's one, E, um, there's a motion that I made where it says committee name in rectangular parentheses. I think it should say SNS there. Point of order. I think it should say regional school committee. Mr. Wolf moved that the regional school oh, committee approve sorry. the search of super because I think that's how the motion was written. The draft motion was written because both committees needed to, to approve it. So I think, I think again, just, just a copy paste thing, yeah. Thank you. Any other edits? Okay. 
final move, we uh, accept the January 23rd, 2024 minutes as amended. Second. Yep. Or just we mm. time just to, voting? Time to vote. <laughs> just voting <laughs> since they've been amended. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Tillman. Aye. Deb. Aye. Bridget. Aye. Sarah. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. William. Aye. Anna. Aye. Irv. Aye. And Sarah Bass. Aye. And, uh, okay. okay. Warrant reports. William, do you have? Um, I was trying to pull it up. Pull it up. Okay, great. Um, very different. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not gonna. It, it, it won't let me view the documents either one of them. I only have two, but it won't let me. Okay. It's never done this before. I signed it both today, I think, or today or yesterday, but it won't let me um, see them. I wonder if they're not. It's the email that says they're finalized, but then it, oh. it, it, it wants me to go to Doc Hub, which I can't go into Doc Hub. Oh. That's not. All right. So for <laughs> next time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, all right. Um, okay. I think there are no Oops. gifts to accept. Um, public comment, I did not receive any ahead of the meeting. Um, but if there's anyone in the public who would like to come make a comment, we will find a chair. <laughs> Thank you. Stephen Sullivan, Shootsbury. I believe you, Lee Cashew. I applaud you for your courage to share your lived truth with a room full of strangers. Not only that, you were amazing as you sat there and listened to a staff person disparage you and basically tell you that your truth is false. You were also accused, along with your parent, of being part of an agenda to keep people of color from leadership positions. That's nuts. I believe you. What I can't believe is, is that the community that was so feisty last spring is silent now. There's nobody here. I sat on this school committee from April 25th, which is a day that's going to stay with me forever, all through May and June, and I continue to follow it through the summer, and there's nobody here. So Lee Cashew, I am very sorry that the community has failed you, but I believe in you, and I've got your back. Thank you. Okay. Um. So our first new and continuing business is um, we need a school committee representative to the arms principal search committee. Um, any volunteer? I had submitted my name. I realized you weren't supposed to, but <laughs> no, I, that's fine. Yes, um, I would be willing to. You'd all good? All right. I don't think we need a vote, so you have been blessed okay. by the committee to now go, go forth. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so given that Doug isn't Sorry, here. Sarah, but yep. I think we should vote. Just you want to vote? I, not that I think there will be an outcome that's different <laughs> than what we just said, but I want him to be able to say that he was okay. properly elected. As Jennifer. As well. I move to appoint William Scher to the Amherst Regional Middle School Principal Search Interview Committee. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? Tillman? Aye. Deb? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. William? Aye. Anna? Aye. Irv? Aye. And Sarah Bass? Aye. Okay. Now you are blessed <laughs> and unanimously voted. Um, Okay, so given that Doug isn't here yet, I am going to suggest we 
rearrange our schedule a little bit and go first to our policies that we have, item F, if everybody's okay with that. Okay, so policy subcommittee. Would you like to introduce me, bring these back? So, um, this, the one that's the second read, which is the policy draft, the BEDH. I was not on the committee when we first did that. Jennifer, do you want to speak to that one? Sure. So this is the second read of that policy, although um, many of you weren't here when we did the first read. But basically, this policy was amended in like December of 21. So that was like in the height of the pandemic when mm -hmm school committee meetings were all virtual and all even participants were virtual and everyone was on Google Meet. And so the practice that we currently have of displaying written comments on the screen came out of that time when people were on a screen um, and could read the, the comments. But now that we're back in person, it, it makes less sense or doesn't make much sense to post, to, sh to display written comments on a screen um, when you know, people in the audience, physically in the audience, might be able to see it or might not, depending on how good their eyesight is and where they're sitting. Um, and people at home, if they're viewing the Amherst Media camera view of this room and they're viewing the screen, it, you, can't, you, you can't read it. So the policy subcommittee um, proposed that we would cease that practice of displaying written comments on a screen. Um, and also, but that we would, I believe there's something in here about making sure that public comments are posted mm -hmm. publicly prior to the meeting so that members of the public can access them um, on our board doc site, site prior to the meeting. So that is the crux of the change, the suggested changes. Um, I think the only other change we had in there is that um, people can submit in their preferred language and that the district will do their best to translate um, so they can be part of the meeting that they are attributed to. Excellent point. And I think we also inc figured out that you can text. You can text your messages in. Right. You can send a text to, to what? To the, to a phone number. To the, to the, the phone number? Or it's on, it's, it's, it's in, it's. Is it not a real yeah. phone? It's, it, 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 it's where you can, I think, leave a voicemail or text, but it's, it does I, supposedly This work. is confusing. I'm pretty sure that you send a text to the email address. That's a little counterintuitive. I don't think it works to text the phone number because it's not a mobile phone number. But I believe you can send a text to the SC public comment at arps.org email address. Like you open your, te your texting program and instead of putting in a number, you put that email address. We've tested it. I think we tested it and I think it worked. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, that's what I remember. remember getting them. Um, <laughs> we could try it now. Can, we could. Can I ask, does it, so it doesn't show who's sending it, or does it show the phone number from which? I would assume it shows the phone, phone number. number. Yeah. But, I, I mean, the, the same goes, right? So in your public comment, when you write it, your. Your email address. Yeah. Yes, but you're also supposed to have your name and your town, your affiliation so with, right, the, with the district. So it was, um, because, I right, your, your email okay. could be. Snuffle bunny. And yeah, so we should. Doesn't tell you who it is. Texting the phone number. Yeah. Text we the should, phone number. but we should confirm. I mean, as the policy. <laughs> I mean, we should confirm. <laughs> um, so, I think I think that the fact that the policy says what it says that you should be able to send your public comment by text is a policy that's appropriate. What it says in board docs in terms of instructions for giving public comment is is a different thing. That's not up to the policy subcommittee. So we should we should confirm what the instruction should say but that doesn't have to hold up the approval of the policy. Sarah? Obviously, this is my first look at it, and I'm not on this subcommittee. So is, is this not the place or time to suggest some other changes? I think it's appropriate. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yep. OK. Um, all right. I, so I wonder, so some meetings, there are many, many, many speakers. Is it possible to, and would we want it to be a policy, um, 
to prioritize speakers for public comment who have a connection to the district. You know, either they live in one of the towns, they have a student, or they're, you know, they're staff or faculty. Sometimes there are people with, who are interested in our schools or our issues, um, but would we want to give priority to? Anna? Yeah, ARPS, yeah. I don't think it's necessary. Mm -hmm. The chair has complete discretion over who to recognize to speak, and so if they wish to yeah. say, we'll mm -hmm. take this other person next, they have the complete authority to do so, mm -hmm. and I think that's enough of a control over who mm -hmm. we prioritize and who we don't prioritize. But Okay, yeah. I wondered, yeah. yeah but um, I do have a comment, though, on the second page. Can't, <coughs> maybe the second page, one, two, three, four. Oh, yes, the fourth bullet, what starts topics of comments. And toward uh, the second half of that paragraph says, comments and complaints, da da da, are generally prohibited. And I don't, I didn't, I don't think that we can prohibit any public comment. We could say we discourage that or, or suggest that people who have such complaints about things that are outside the school committee's responsibility refer to the district handbook to see, you know, do they contact a teacher or a principal or, or, or what. But I don't think we can prohibit, <laughs> except for um, abusive, well, violent sort of language. <coughs> well, I think that I don't think we should wordsmith it now. I think we should take the input back to the policy subcommittee and yeah. It also occurs to me that the in between when this policy was read the first time and now there's there was that Massachusetts mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. law court, uh, yeah. court decision that we should just review it our, and, and make sure we're in compliance. But happy to oh. I have a question about the last bullet in the first page. It says public comment normally will be for a period no longer than 15 minutes. That's probably true, but <laughs> since we're giving the chair the discretion to stop at any time, why are we writing this as a policy? Because nothing happens at 15 minutes unless the chair wants, and if the chair wants five minutes, then it's over after five minutes. It seems that an expectation doesn't necessarily need to be in a policy. Jennifer? I, I think that that's in there to sort of give the chair, um, to support the chair in deciding to end the public comment period at 15 minutes. I mean, the chair could choose to end at five minutes, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't encourage that. That wouldn't be very democratic. But if the chair decided to end at 15 minutes, their defense could be, that's our policy. So I think it's in there to support the chair. I think it also gives um, like a clear block of time, right? So it's not, you know, public comment happens during the whole meeting back and forth. It's just like, you know, this piece. So you should try and be here for this piece if you'd like to um, speak. I'm just wondering, it all, it occurred to me that like any way that we could make it easier for families to comment would be terrific. And I know now on um, Parent Square, we're posting the meetings and I'm just wondering if we couldn't just have a link or something that was like comment here. And then under this policy, we'd receive them, we'd know what people are thinking about, but it wouldn't take up a big chunk of the meeting either. Well, the, they already, or can email the same, the same way, so, which does the same thing. I'm just trying to think of ways to make it easier for people maybe where literacy is, like where there could be barriers of literacy where you might not go in and read a whole chunk of text and look for the email and look for all these details, but just something simple like, you know, comment here or your opinion here or something like that where you could click through. Tillman? No, I think, sir. Um, I also have suggestions about how to better publicize when and how to comment, but I think someone said earlier that this is 
that's a different matter. So I, I'd be interested. I'm not on Parent Square. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. Um, but I think that is a that is a discussion we should have. But maybe it's a separate discussion. Okay, tell me. I feel that a public comment is a very different thing than a reply on an online website, <laughs> and I would like to set up the policy so that it's clear that a public comment remains a statement with some gravitas and not be conflated with you know something you do on your personal device you know while walking around Jennifer so I was going to say something similar to Tillman in that a public comment is not just what's your opinion click here to give your opinion it's a comment that you want to make to the school committee that you want to be made in public or that you want to be available for the public. I mean, you know, all or most of the communications we receive are public documents, but a public comment is a special type of, as Tillman said, it's like with intention, you want this to be public, that's why you're, that's why you're making a public comment. So I think I want people to be able to like read what the policy is for public comment and know that their publics are going their comments are going to be public because sometimes people want to contact us but they don't want it to be public comment so we want to make sure that we we're, we're giving both avenues so i don't necessarily know that like a link on parent square for i don't know but uh, i have to think about that of whether a link on like when the notification goes out on parent square that a meeting is happening should the information be there about how to give a public comment maybe but to sarah's point that's not a policy, that specific thing, having it on Parent Square is not a policy thing. A pol um, in my opinion, a policy thing would be the district will make every effort to make access to public comment as open as possible to people, to, to all people regardless of ability. Like that's the kind of thing a policy would be. And then a practice would be having, having a link on the ARPS website, having a link in Parent Square, that, that's the kind of practice thing that's not a, at the policy level. Thank you. Uh, Irv? Yeah, I think this 15 minute um, limitation should be taken out. And the reason for that is that we now, uh, when people are making public comments, we make it clear that each person has a, a, a maximum of three minutes. If we stick to that, that would mean that only five people would be able to make comments. And I think that that is too limiting. I would rather have it not in there at all and leave it to the discretion of the chair. Thanks, sir. Hmm? Yeah. Any other comments? Jen? I also have um, some thoughts about public comment, not the policy as, as we're writing it, but communication with the public about what public comment is and is not would be, I think, helpful for new people getting involved in the in the public school system or in, in this part of it. Okay. So, yep, Jennifer? So, yeah, so I, I would, I, I mean, I won't speak for the chair, but I think the committee should take this input and, and go back and, and look at our policy again. I just want to respond to what Irv said about removing the, the sentence about, the, uh, the way it's currently written it says, public comment normally will be for a period no longer than 15 minutes. The length of the public comment segment will be determined by the chair. So that like, I see Tillman's point, like why do you even bother saying 15 minutes if the length of this is determined by the chair? But, so that leaves the discretion to the chair as to the length of the public comment session. Um, and, but for the reasons that have already been stated, I think that it, I think that I would like to keep the, the, the 15 minutes in there because I think it at least sets some expectations. Even though there are always exceptions to those expectations, I think it sets some expectations. And, you know, I, Irv is right just doing the math that if each public comment speaker uses their full three minutes, then only five can speak. But not everyone does. I mean, m some people push up against that three minutes and some people don't take that whole three minutes. Sometimes we have like 20 people you know, who want to speak. Sometimes we have zero. So I think it's okay that we have both sentences in there, normally 15 minutes, but the length is determined by the chair. But again, I think the subcommittee should take this back and yeah. discuss it. Yes. Uh, Irv? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it, to, to have it in there is superfluous. Uh, you know, why put something that limiting in there when we're making it uh, at the discretion of the chair? Why well, put it out there as some warning uh, to the public? Hey, you, 
uh, we're, only, we're gonna, really going to allow you to have 15 minutes, when in fact that would not be true. So, I, you know, it's up to the, you know, there's policy subcommittee, but I would vote against it if you had that 15 minutes in there because it's superfluous. All right, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Bridget. I would just say that I, I agree with Irvin Tillman, and I think the piece that sticks with me is that there's opportunities for public comment if we say most people will, or that it will be a maximum of three minutes. That gives the idea that most people who come and come to speak to us will be heard. And it concerns me a little bit to think that maybe if the chair didn't feel like hearing a lot of people on that topic, then we just might not. And so maybe it's just a little bit more democratic not to have it in, you know, in my thinking right now. <laughs> so I think uh, we should have the policy subcommittee take all of our mm -hmm. input back and maybe come back for a Second, second read. <laughs> Can Sarah? you remind me who else, or is it just you two? Oh, there's uh, four who's of on us. the? No, it's um, there's five of us. Oh. Anna, myself, um, Jennifer, Jennifer, and Deb, and oh. Debbie. And who? Debbie. Debbie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the next policy is policy IGA. I'm trying. And when she pulls it up, we've just made one, added some words um, in one section. So it said the superintendents will establish appropriate curriculum committees for the development, <coughs> review, and evaluation of revision of the curriculum and guides and instructional programs. We added um, for them to include teachers within the appropriate areas of expertise. Sarah? Um, I have two questions. One, was there any particular reason, uh, like, had there been a committee without educators or? I'm just, I mean, I have no objection. I'm just curious what prompted. I, maybe the there was addition. a feeling of that, that maybe teachers weren't always included, I mm. guess. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can I offer a suggestion mm -hmm. to the first paragraph, the last sentence in the first paragraph? The school committee will encourage and support the professional staff in its efforts to, and then a series of. Um, tasks. I would say, I would hope that the, f the first thing they, the staff would do is assess the effectiveness of the current curriculum because it's a lot of work to investigate new curriculum. Why would you do that? Why would you, you know, it, presumably, and maybe it just assumes that there's some sense that a, a particular curriculum is not serving the students. So, um, I would think there should be that justification first. Uh, Irv? Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting to me that uh, <coughs> William or this committee, the subcommittee thought it was necessary to put uh, teachers and staff in there uh, because it's impossible to do curriculum without teachers and their input. And usually, and usually when curriculums are, are, are um, are, are thought about or going to be introduced, it's at the uh, behest of the teachers. Uh, they are the first line of it uh, in terms of bringing up whether there should be a, a new curriculum or no or a new curriculum or revised curriculum. So uh, that when William said that, I was thinking, my God, I, how do you do curriculum without teachers? Tillman? 
to Sarah's point, um, at the end of that paragraph, it says, and evaluate results. So whenever we previously encouraged them to do something new, then the evaluation of those results is, should be ongoing, which then triggers maybe the innovative new uh, investigation. I, under I, that's, I understand that, um, but I, th and maybe it doesn't need to be spelled out, but I would, I would hope there is, before you undertake to develop or choose a new curriculum, you have identified specifically what is inadequate about the current curriculum. And so. Thank you. Any other comments? I would just sink in what Sarah said in a sense, like we want to know what learning gaps are there, what learning outcomes aren't being met, with what subgroups, all those things, so that when you're selecting the upcoming curriculum, you, you know. So really understanding what's working and not working already is really important. Uh, Earth? Just remember uh, the uh, math curriculum coordinator who came before the school committee. I would like for you to remember her process, the, the process she pointed out in terms of bringing on a new math curriculum and also evaluating the current curriculum. Uh, just remember that in terms of this new policy uh, and, and, and realize that there is a huge process and system in place for uh, bringing on new curriculum or disposing of an old curriculum. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments? The policy subcommittee will take this one back and bring it back for a second read also? Awesome. Okay, thank you. So, <laughs> uh, how about uh, if we go to the school equity advisory committee charge and possible, possible, oh. Just so you know, um, page 14 for the district office, it's page 52 of Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Can yeah. I say something while we're reading? Absolutely. To the pre previous reading, um, the second to last paragraph has a school committee in singular, whereas everywhere else is school committees plural. Since we have nothing better to do, then <laughs> we can speak very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about we? Oh boy, all right, lost my. I just, I just <laughs> Yay. Okay. Let's see if, if I can do this. I I'm really sorry, guys. <laughs> so your math curriculum and your block schedule were both victims of the pandemic. That's how we ended up with the block schedule. Sarah Best, would you like to take a recess for a few minutes? Sure, yes. Let's take a five minute recess okay. so I can <laughs> <laughs> Not feel figure so out how pressured. to do this. <laughs> so Thank seven. you, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so come back at 7, 17. Can you help me? <laughs>
is working. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Um, so before we do uh, anything else, let's go to the School Equity Advisory Committee charge and possible uh, review and possible vote, if that's all right with everyone. Because I did get a message from the superintendent that should be here very shortly. Or the technology will work and <laughs> things will come back. Um, okay. So, do you want to? Sure. I'm the, I, I was appointed to be on this committee um, and have come to realize that we're not really working within these confinements. Um, and so Bridget is now on there with me and so the two of us have chatted um, and we've talked to um, Sarah Bass about what we need to do with this committee to get it back on track as far as the number of members and the type of membership and everything like that so yeah. that's kind of where we're at. Jennifer? So William and Bridget, it, what is this document? So this document is from the original charge that the school committee did a few years ago. I'm, we're not quite sure. But this is what's currently, if you go look under board docs, under committees, this is the description of what the committee is. Currently, I think there's like three people and myself that kind of come to the meetings. Um, no one is serving any certain terms. There are no students. There is one staff that kind of comes. Um, they don't uh, do monthly updates. They're not doing a yearly report currently. They were in the past, but not right now. Uh, Sarah? Um, you, you implied, or at least I inferred, that the group is talking about or discusses matters other than these two or in addition to these two? Did I, I um, gather there was a, a creep in the... So it's called School Equity Advisory uh -huh. Committee. Um, so it should that should be what it's about, which right. I think is kind of encompassing in those two tasks. Okay, I have a um, a response. I and I I know nothing about this committee. This is all new to me. But um, task one. We're, review restorative justice program and impacts and advise on approaches to expand the program and presence in the schools seem to me presumes that the program is a good one and effective and should be expanded. I mean, there isn't anything I about like <clears throat> I, you know, find out how it should be strengthened or modified or... I, I think yeah. the original restorative justice program was brought forth mm -hmm. by the committees or task force or whatever predated the school equity advisory committee. This hmm. group of people have been around for many, many years um, and they've evolved into three or four different names. Um, so I think that they had their hand in the restorative justice in the beginning mm -hmm. is my understanding of the history. Right. But if we're, if we're considering this as a charge, like to, to affirm that this is now, you know, the charge and let's stick with it, I would, I would suggest modifying that. That's why first we're here. One. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think that, um, well, the first thing I'd like to say is I think, you know, that this could be a very valuable committee. It's really too important of a topic to languish. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've heard very recently that there, there's quite a bit of concern around the issues related to, to race and equity and in a very intersectional way. So I want to make sure that this is a robust committee and it's a committee that's getting the full important attention that it deserves. Um, but to that end, reading this um, charge, you know, it's outdated and it needs, needs some work. And I guess some, um, the other thing is there's some documents that say, you know, specific things I think we need to recruit and make the committee more robust mm -hmm. and get more voices, especially people with current students in the school district on it. And, um, and so maybe the next step is for 
William and I to come back to you all with a charge that some that takes in some of your feedback on what you think might be important in an equity subcommittee right now, considering that this document, though very valuable at its time, like also needs needs a refresh. Yeah, Tillman? During that process, can I suggest that also the climate for staff be considered, not just the student learning? Oh, yeah. Nice. <coughs> I done. Um, in terms of reviewing the district policy uh, progress on goals around these issues, perhaps presenting what the goals are would be helpful as well. Um, again, for me, who's brand new to at least this part of the process. Wait. Uh, Irv? The, the question for me is why has this committee almost been dormant and and why has there been such a lack of participation uh, with the members uh, that are supposed to be a part of this committee I was gonna say I don't think that the people that show up would think the committee's been dormant I think they would feel that their power has been taken away from them um, and they're very passionate about this advisory committee. I know that they used to be a task force and we as a school committee took the task force label away from them and made them an advisory committee prior to most of us being there. Um, so they feel kind of disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged from that process. Um, I don't know. I, Jennifer? Can I? Can, yeah. So can I, uh, you can go next, sir. Jennifer's turn. Um. Mm -hmm. To address Herb's question, I think that this group, I think that the school committee member or members who have been appointed to this committee, I don't know, somehow the connection between this committee and the school committee has not been strong. Um, but I hear that like current committee members want it to be strong, so that's a good thing. So I think that's why we haven't heard much from this committee is because for whatever reason, the connection between that, that this committee and our committee has, has not been strong. So I, what I'm hearing is that the two school committee members are going to work on revising, recommending a new goal or mission and, and scope. So, so and, and we're giving input, which I think is a great idea. And then you guys can come back to us and we can discuss it more and then vote on it. I want to suggest a committee structure, like a chair and vice chair. Um, and that the and that it, it, that it specifically say monthly updates to be given by the chair of that committee to the regional school committee, and then like a yearly report, you know, to, just to identify and name who's going to give these, who's going to do these things. Um, I'm I I see that it has two staff and teachers, two staff slash teachers, which I'm I'm my my thought is that I would love to see a stipend for that participation, and that we shouldn't expect our educators to attend evening meetings and do extra work that's unpaid um, and I don't and I don't know if there's another example of a school committee related or a school committee run subcommittee that has teachers if there's some model we can use I don't actually think that there is so that's but then now we have the search committee yeah, too which is not to paid yeah but it's um, short term it's yeah short -term. yeah short -term. so so just a thought that can we, could we consider a stipend for school staff? Yeah, I would suggest that, you know, just um, these two members uh, and, 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 and William, you know, I beg to differ with, I did, it was dormant because I cannot remember uh, in the last year or two years or three years having any of this, any reports from this committee come before the school committee. They didn't know they I cannot to. remember any. Maybe there might be somewhere in the minutes, but I don't think so. They didn't know. Uh, so yeah, it, it has been dormant, but it, it doesn't mean it has to remain dormant. The thing is that I, I believe that these two, the two of you who are on, who, who want to re, uh, bring this committee back to. Uh, some prominence, you, you know, have a lot of work to do in terms of a populating it with the population that's st uh, stipulated in the policy itself. So, you know, 
So I applaud you I, I, because it is an important committee. Uh, I have no idea why it was has been so inactive. So I think I'm not sure exactly where the charge is coming from. Is it going to be discussed amongst the chairs and then amongst the committee members and come back to us? Because that feels like it's an important part of the process, but I also feel like as an advisory committee, the charge should really come from the committee, the full committee. I was just say we currently have no chairs of the committee. Okay. Sarah? It, it strikes me as a very large committee, and I don't know if we have other advisory committees so I, I just don't know how to think about that. That's, it's a lot of people. So it's more recruiting. It's just, you know, it's a bigger effort. Um, so perhaps you'll consider that. I would also want to know who is responsible for recruiting all these <laughs> people. Is it going to be the school committee, one of the school committee people tasked with serving on this? Do you know who's currently on the committee? Who are current members? There are people that attend the meeting. <laughs> I, d I don't know if we have a, a roster of who's on it. The roster may be 20 people. I don't know. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But there are consecutive, pretty regularly, there are three public people that come and then one staff member and myself. And also, if they are one-year terms, if you want to keep that, I would suggest that this mm -hmm. charge state when the term begins. You know, <laughs> so you know, or or when it ends, so you know when you're done, and then how to you know to ramp up and find new people or or whatever. Done. So if it's different from the school equity task force, there's currently an ARPS page that's the school equity task force. So to the extent that it's evolved, the either that page should be taken down or rewritten. I just wanted to say that there is um, a document as well. It's not here, but it states that the school committee appoints the members to that task force. So um, I'm not sure where in board docs we'd find that it, information, it, but yeah. I, I think I can find it in the email. Okay. It's, it's the policy about subcommittees and advisory committees. Yeah. Is, and it, it states that we appoint people for the committee. Sarah? So I'm confused. Is, is there both a school equity task force and an advisory committee, or are these just the names of just I think there was an original name and then it changed. And I think there's oh, they when it changed from a task force the same to committee? Yeah. they are the same. They have the same history. Same. They just it, yeah. yeah. There, there are okay. there are not two separate bodies. They're the same body. The name, the name of the name body changed. changed from task force to advisory committee. Um, and it was it, other names before that. <laughs> and there's a whole history I could share if you would like me to like, no. share those documents. I can email them to you. This is no one's fault, but there are many outdated ARPS web page <laughs> pages. So yes, I think that sh okay. that, that page should be unpublished. Um, so uh, what I was going to say was, who decides who are going to be the members on the committee? And I'm hearing, and it, I think it's appropriate that the school committee uh, uh, votes to approve members to the this advisory committee. So that should be part of the the charge or the description of the committee that you guys um, put together. Um, you know, like we just did for the for the SNS, you know, the subcommittee can recruit or however you're going to do it, members, and then have them be a appointed or voted on or officially approved by the school committee. So, um, yeah, I think having a stated structure and, and like documenting how that all that would work would be helpful. Thank you. So it's policy BDF. Okay. That gives us some power to do that. Uh, Sarah? So these two tasks, assuming they persist in, in some form, 
Um, these, are, these are big questions and big issues, and it seems, especially if there's going to be so much work that there's maybe monthly updates, that that's going to take some staff time, like administrative support to be generating the data or finding the, you know, and are we okay with that? Or does the superintendent have any thoughts about supporting the work of the committee? Right. Um, Anna? I'm just wondering if a lot of this charter came out of the same era of appointing Doreen Cunningham as the equity advisor and sort of like this need. It was before that. It was way before yeah. this. Okay. Uh, I'll see if I can find the history and send it to you. Right. I, I, I do think that, you know, a charter that includes um, providing guidance on best practices to increase diversity and equity and inclusion um, and maybe um, sort of, yeah, in some way monitoring the progress of that in both student learning and in staff um, environments, but then also um, when there are, I don't know, holes or, you know, if we start going down instead of up or whatever, to sort of be the alert committee to say, okay, we had been making progress, but we are stalling out, or right now we're on a very nice plateau which we would like to maintain, or just sort of like setting some guidance for where the school district should be on some of these issues, and then providing some guidance or recommendations when they see fit. I think the only thing we need to remember and be careful about is that it need, they need to be things that are under our purview. Yeah. Um, so not processes, but policies. Uh, Deb? So um, this feels like a committee looking for a charge because we all recognize that the issue of equity is very important to our district. Um, so I'm just a little confused about the role of tax, task forces, advisory committees, and subcommittees because these issues that, that Anna just started talking about sound like those are tasks that the public has uh, given to us as elected members to evaluate, perform, and I'm not clear on where the role of um, members of the public fit into the policy decisions or recommendations. So I, I think it's task force and advisory committees that can have members that are not the members of the committee, right? So subcommittees are just the committee members doing a committee thing, right? right. Like, like the policy subcommittee looking at the policies, revamping them as needed. And I think, I'm sure it's in, what did you say? It's B BDF. BDF, mm -hmm. the, the policy. I think it, it spells it out a little bit better um, because there are times when um, the public or people who are not part of the committee can be, have an advisory role to it. Uh, Bridget? I would just say I think that the reasoning behind that in this particular case is that we won't have every um, sort of sector of our community or voice represented necessarily on this committee, and so we can bring in people from the school community to help um, sort of alert us and advise us as to patterns, to their experiences, to, to different pieces like that. And so having voices that aren't just here are important. <coughs> Did you have a follow-up? Well, I yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at the analysis part. The voices, the perspective, the <coughs> input, yeah, definitely, but then the level at which we're getting at the analysis of discipline or academic achievement or participation, I'm not sure how that fits together with uh, a committee that involves members of the public. 
Sarah, and then. Yeah, it, well, and especially because student records <laughs> and, dis, you know, including discipline and academics are all, you know, that's not available to members of the public, so. Well, I was just going to say that it started off as Oasis <laughs> back in 1990, um, and Oasis. then I believe uh, in 2015 or 2014 <laughs> is when the um, school equity task force was created by the regional school committee. It was in 2014, um, so it has a long history of of activism and being here in the district. So, all right, this sounds like a lot to ask of the two of you since that you sit, Bridget and William, on the committee <laughs> currently. Um, do you? I think it, it would be nice for us to be charged with coming up with a new charge, presenting that, yep. and then. I do believe it's the school committee's then job to appoint or ask for applications or whatever to serve on that. Yeah. I, That's kind of what I would like to have is for the two of us to not be chairs because I think it's, it could be a community, could, so a community member could be a chair, but mm -hmm. just for the two of us to work on So the maybe So maybe we start back. with the charge and kind of revamp what is up here, right? what we think the membership should look like and all of those pieces, bring that information back for the full committee to have another discussion about. And then once it goes out to the public to have uh, the school committee member who was on it as the chair to start. And then if the committee afterward I, maybe we can decide on that later. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I would just say, like, um, I think we lost the direct line to the school committee. So mm -hmm. even if it were co-chair, I would like for that direct line to continue mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. the reporting back to this committee could be strong. Mm -hmm. Yep. I like that, too. Deb? Um, so just looking at the charge, um, it would be helpful if you kept in mind the, you know, the acronyms, you know, specific, measurable, et cetera, et cetera. Achievable, relevant, time bound, yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Okay, so we just have our cards left. Okay. Uh, how about review of and approval of the FY25 lunch uh, part and fees? Yeah, so I think, um, help, help if I spoke into the microphone, sorry. <laughs> sorry I was late, uh, working on some uh, some work with our legal counsel and trying to get something buttoned up and finished up, uh, but wasn't quite done yet. But thank you for your patience. Um, so what we have here, uh, we haven't really since the pandemic started, you know, reviewed our fees. Um, you know, we're suggesting a few changes, some things staying the same. Um, uh, and we'll probably try to be on a much more regular schedule of updating some of these things in order to sort of keep pace with inflation. Um, so our college applications, this is about creating transcripts for folks to send off to colleges. Um, you know, it, it, what we do with the revenue from this is, is to buy some of the uh, software package that we use to help kids apply electronically and to track and put together their applications. And so it's a, um, a way to... Um, you know, just offset a cost uh, and and promote a, a more robust way for kids to to uh, apply to a variety of schools and do things like the Common App and some of that sort of stuff. Um, parking fees, uh, you know, we have generally used this fund um, sparingly over the years because we we sort of save up the money and then uh, probably three years ago, maybe four, we did some a small amount of patching in the in the parking lot to help cover the. Uh, cost of that we use the the revenue we generate from this um you know we've at times been more proactive about sort of 
making sure that people have stickers and that sort of stuff. Uh, it's a pretty passive process in a lot of, in a lot of ways, but you know, part of it is a little bit of a discouragement for kids driving to school. Um, and at the same time, uh, we recognize they're going to, it's one of the things about, you know, getting, becoming of age is to sort of, you know, explore that freedom if you have the opportunity. And so, um, but, uh, but again, you know, it's a way to help offset some of the costs of, of maintaining a parking lot. And the more cars we have, the more maintenance it needs. And so this helps us out. Um, and again, a modest increase from, from a, a fee we haven't really changed over several years. Um, uh, musical instrument rental, again, we use this uh, when kids rent instruments from us. It, we use the funds from this to repair the instruments and keep them in, in, in working uh, and, and operational or buy new equipment, if, uh, you know, new equipment periodically if, if they wear out. They do, you know, you can wear out an instrument. It does, um, they last a long time, but at the same time, we try to keep them in, in decent shape, and so that helps us offset some costs there. And, um, and I think the biggest change is in and around school lunch. Now, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that has been in place for the last couple of years, and partly why we haven't really looked at this closely, is because we've had universal free meals, which is expected to continue. I think it's one of the best uh, things the federal and state government have done over the last couple of years. I think the, the, you know, the, uh, the benefit for the investment has been tremendous. Um, it it lowers the threshold for kids being able to access and participate in our lunch programs, which makes them uh, economically more viable. And uh, the benefits of kids having, you know, food available and and uh, uh, you know, there there are people of means that like forget their lunch and they don't have any money on them, and so this just mitigates that. And so kids are going to have a greater and better experience in their in their classrooms if they've had had breakfast or had lunch. It's really it's a big difference maker in my opinion, and and a really low cost thing. But we do have to keep pace uh, with uh, the reimbursements from the federal government. And so we have to sort of adjust our prices to make sure that they're above the reimbursement. We can't, you know, have meal prices below the reimbursement from the feds um, and from the state in combination. So that's part of the adjustment here and why they're a little more significant than what you see in some of the other ones. Um, basically, what we're doing is taking the lunch price to $4. That's a pretty, you know, 75 cent jump is pretty big. Um, breakfast goes to 2 uh, adult lunch, 475. The only one we, and then milk is, I think we kept steady at 60 cents. Um, the adult lunch is the only one we actually collect at present. And, you know, we pick things like 425 so that making change is a lot easier. We don't want to deal with dimes and nickels very much. Um, we don't have a tremendous number of staff that buy lunch. But we do have some. Um, it's still a fairly inexpensive lunch. Um, and so it's an option for, for staff to take advantage of as well. But the idea here is, is one, to stay in compliance with what we need to in the, school, in the National School Lunch Program, which we participate in. Um, and if for whatever reason the, you know, the state or federal government decides not to support this in the future and we have to go back to charging lunch, we'll be in a price range that, that is uh, functional for our program. Uh, I'm really hopeful that doesn't happen. You know, schools are not very good at collecting small amounts of money like this. and. Uh, and uh, like I said, the benefit of, of uh, universal free lunch for kids has been really tremendous. It's really been a positive thing, in my opinion. And uh, our participation rates are much higher, and uh, I think the you know kids are are better off for having food available. Um, just as an aside, talking about lunch, you know, one of the things that's a factor when when thinking about whether to close school for snow is around meal service. There are kids that get two meals a day with us, and it's a pretty critical thing. Uh, yeah. To, to have those available to kids. So we really do weigh that as a factor when, when thinking about it. We want kids to get to school safely. Um, and we also want to make sure that those support that we provide in a number of ways, that's not the only one. We do a lot of other things for kids as far as uh, supports besides just, you know, the educational, the raw educational stuff you think of. Uh, but this is one of the, to my mind, one of the profound ways we support kids. So it's, it's important to have a program that works and functions financially for the district. Um, so small changes, uh, as, as noted at the top of the memo, um, we haven't looked at athletic fees. That's a bigger conversation. We'll probably come back to that. We traditionally do a lot of these in, in, in a kind of November time frame in, in sort of trying to align with the, the coming budget. Um, we knew we needed to take some action on a couple of these. These will all take effect for fiscal 25. Uh, athletic fees, if we were to adjust those, we would have that come to you guys in probably November or so of, of this year for the following fiscal year. So that's why it says fiscal 26. And again, that's a keeping pace with inflation type of adjustment. That one's a, a little more involved because it's a much more complex structure of, of fees that we want. So the suggested motion is just to approve those as presented, but I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Uh, Jennifer? 
I have a comment and then maybe two questions. Um, I'm generally in favor of raising fees like this a little bit every year because I think that it, it, it <coughs> then it sort of, uh, uh, so I'm in favor of the, uh, I'm in favor of all of these increases because they're pretty small. But I also note that all of them haven't been, haven't gone up in several years, which I hear you're, you, you mentioned some of the reasons, but like, yeah, I think it, it, it hurts less to raise it a small amount every year than to raise it a big amount. All, all in one year, which is not what we're doing. But anyway, I'm in favor of these. My questions are the parking fees, that's for students, not for staff. Correct. Right? Okay. And so students need a sticker? Yes. Hypothetically. And do, are staff just given a sticker? Like, how do you? Differentiate? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, <laughs> typically, well, so here's the thing. Staff generally arrive first and park much closer. And the <laughs> quality of their cars, generally speaking, is a little different than the staff. You know, staff are different than students. It's not a, a you know a, a be all end all, and again we're it, it's pretty passive the enforcement. I don't yeah, want to overstate yeah. it. You know okay. it's a bit of an honor system in some respects. We have had in in years past, um, you know more proactive approach to that. Um, but we also you know in that vein we also notice who gets in and out of a certain car, gotcha. right? So that's the other thing is that you can kind of glance at the parking lot who gets in and drives it away, right? Um, that's another way to do it. So it's. You know, and again, we're not, you know, like chasing people down the hall, like, hey, you, you know, yeah. you owe me $78. Um, the other thing I'll just comment just back, you know, sort of raising them every year. Traditionally, that would be what we've done. We just haven't, with, with shifts in pandemic and whatnot, that yeah. this was not as, as urgent a thing to change. Um, and some of them we actually suspended a little bit during the time frame. So, so we will get back onto that kind of a regular schedule of small incremental changes because I think that's a little more typical and, and like you say, sort of easier to, to tolerate. Great. And then my next question is, can you explain again about school lunch? Like, it's free for everyone, but there's a reimbursement. And like, what is, what is the setting the price have to do with the reimbursement? Can you just explain that again? So, um, you know, we still have a record of who is qualified for free or reduced price lunch. Um, it's always best if folks fill out the application. We do a, a, we're required as part of our program to do a thing called direct certification where we send the names to the state. They match that up against some of their other lists. Uh, and we try to qualify as many kids that way as we can. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty critical piece. Uh, a little more for our elementary school. We've had it. You know, there are still things tied to that, like Title One is tied to that. Um, so it's important for families that that um, you know qualify to still fill out those applications for us um, because it does uh, you know play into um, uh, some supports in other ways for us. So that's that's one piece of it. Um, so depending on whether a, a child is qualified for free or reduced or neither, um, the reimbursement from the federal government is different. So for you know uh, a fully paid fully paid uh, meal, the reimbursements I want to say twenty three cents. Um, you know, but for uh, a free lunch, the reimbursements like four twenty three. Um, actually, it can't be four twenty three because it's only four dollars, so it would be less than that. But but nonetheless. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm misquoting the number, but the, the, so when we're recording meals served, we have to know the student and how they qualify, and that makes a difference on how much reimbursement we get. Um, so that's, that's a piece of it. Um, the, there are limitations on how much you can increase a price from one year to the next around school lunch. Again, that's a limitation of the program, and again, while we'll really probably do this a couple of times over the next couple of years to kind of keep pace, even though the the federal reimbursements will change a little bit, but not will change the price a little more aggressively than that. There's there's some limits on how quickly you can write, raise those prices, but we need to get back in alignment with the with the federal program. Um, and now I'm trying to remember the other part of your question. Um, yeah. What am I missing? Well, that was basically it. I just I guess I I was I wasn't understanding which came first. Does the federal government determine the reimbursement rate, the reimbursement amount, and then we <coughs> set our price to match that or to be in line with that, or do we? Tell them how much we charge. No. No, no, no. They they set the reimbursement. So, okay. uh, and then and then our price has has parameters around what it can be. Okay. Um, and so we're, you know, we're needing to have our price, you know, um, ultimately, you know, more than uh, what the reimbursement is, um, or at least equal to on the free lunch. Um, and what we're trying to do as far as, you know, when we look at our sort of metrics of, of production, we're trying to get our, our per meal price to be on a par with what the full reimbursement from the federal government is because, um, you know, that, that 
you know, doesn't put us in a negative. But we do have a small amount of, you'll notice in the budgets that there's a small amount of, of support from the from uh, the appropriated budget to help support the program. It's much reduced this year, partly because our balances are in good shape, because with fully free meals and increase in, in participation, the economics work a lot better for us. And so the, the balances have grown a little bit. We need to, you know, spin those down a little bit. Um, so the amount of support we need from the appropriated budget to help our food service programs a lot less. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Bridget? Um, I think I'm, my question about the college application um, service and the musical instrument service, um, I'm wondering if there is a discounted rate for that. I'm particularly interested in, um, you know, the first category of free and reduced lunch, a uh, price of 40 or $78 might make the difference in whether a student could participate. On the other hand, I, I would say, as someone you know who has a student who drives, that a hundred dollar fee would is a small fee if you're already paying all the other costs of what a car is. So there may be room for movement that might build in some equity for the lower income groups. Yeah, uh, that conversation about the sort of upper end on the parking fee. Yeah, I don't disagree with you necessarily. It's just how big a jump can we take in 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 a short amount of time. I do think getting more towards $100 is probably a more appropriate number ultimately that we'll, we'll head in that direction. I think on the, you know, to your point around uh, musical instrument rental and and uh, the college application services, again, you know, it's three for free. It's whether you're applying to more schools than that. There are, um, certainly on the musical instrument rental, we don't have a price quoted there, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, if, if uh, if there's a hardship circumstance, then we can take that into consideration. I would, I would have to check specifically with, you know, how often those cases come up. But I think, you know, we do waive fees, you know, um, in some of those circumstances. That would probably be also true under the applications. But, but that's a, you know, four dollars is is a pretty modest price. Um, but again, we, you know, again, I think if if there's a circumstance uh, on a case by case basis where you know there's a hardship, we we consider that for sure. I would just say, just quick follow up is four dollars is a modest price, but the average college senior is applying for like between ten and, sadly, twenty schools now. So, it's more like eh, thirty, thirty something to eighty if we want low income students to participate at the same rate as you know as other people who have seniors, and right. high school, and then just. If it's on a case-by-case -case basis, that sometimes that's an act that discourages folks. Right. So I would lo really love to see some something, especially for the for the first category of free and really juice lunch, which is I think a, a situation where the folks could be excluded. In the second category, you, folks may be able to scrape up that amount. Yeah. Yeah. I <clears throat> excuse me. You know, with the with the common app uh, where you can apply to. You know, with a single application, you can apply to multiple schools. I'm not sure how like your transcript falls into that. I just I, I'd have to check because mm -hmm. it could be a circumstance where a single you know one of your three is if it's in your common app, suddenly you've got sure. 15 applications with within that free category. I just don't know. I'll mm -hmm. have to check on that. I can get back to you on that. That'd be perfect. Still mix. I move to approve the FY25 piece as presented in the memo from the interim finance director, dated 2624. Second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Sarah? Yeah, I, I uh, agree with Bridget and, and feel that we really, sh we shouldn't make kids plead hardship. That if, if a discount for a musical instrument is possible, let's just offer it. So I will say the following. Technically, uh -huh. we cannot use uh, free and reduced price qualification uh -huh. without express written permission from the family to use it. So we can't use it as a criteria to discount things without written permission. So if if we if someone qualifies for free and reduced lunch, if they want us to use that to give them a discount, they have to actively tell us that. We can't by design uh, or, or by default award them that. Right. As a result, it's the same circumstance. I, I, I would argue it's effectively the same thing. So asking 
in hardship cases. There's also circumstances where people have hardships that are temporary that we might give a discount on that, that where they might not qualify for free or reduced lunch. So it, 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 there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, and again, I, I, I can check to see. We can certainly put a price line in there for, for a discount rate to, to give people guidance on that. I just don't know how often it comes up and, and whether they probably, you know, most likely they waive it completely in that circumstance. But Right. But as far as the notification part of it, it's kind of the same whether we, um, you know, ask them to tell us it's a hardship or they give us permission to, to use the free and reduced lunch application. So. Well, I, 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 I think it would be good to make it known that if you do qualify, you can request it. Mm -hmm. it up, because then they, it might not occur to a student that this is available. Thank you. Did you still have it? I did, yeah. Okay. Just a quick thing oh sorry sorry thank you <laughs> I just had a qu again it was uh, very related to one of the previous questions about the college application fee is the is what the school is doing simply creating a transcript and sending it to the schools is that is that what college application materials means Yes, it's an official transcript. an official transcript. So it, it's like special paper and the whole drill. So and even electronically, it's it's marked in a way that that it is, you know, an official transcript. Like you know, in once upon a time, they'd actually like crimp the paper with an right. indicia sort of thing. So it's that type of official transcript because you know the students could run, uh, you know, um, or ask for just a, an unofficial one easily. They can actually run some of that themselves if, if they wanted to leverage power school for that. It's but so right Ricky. now, what it takes to produce an official transcript is essentially, do you just have to press a button or do you have to like pull together a whole bunch of information and get it all together and then print the transcript? If it's a physical hard copy, it's, it's like I said, it's special paper. So if you're printing it out, you have to like stop, change the paper. You know, we don't have a printer with just that paper in it, right? So it's, it is a, a bit of a process. And I think that if it's electronic, I'd have to check um, what the what the generation process is like, but you know, partly it's a sort of, you know, why we. It, it, I, I think you're difficult to explain to say, oh, it's four dollars if you want a hard copy, but if it's it's two dollars if you want electronic. I mean, yeah, the effort may not be the same, but but again, the end result of what we're trying to to do with the revenue is to fund a, a, a software program that allows kids to apply the most cost effectively way way they can. And so it's a it's again a sort of you know, um, rising tide ups all boats situation to some extent, and and differentiating the price would would um, I think complicated in ways that aren't helpful. But it's just you know that's an opinion. But you know, you guys can offer to have it be different than that if you'd like. I was just wondering if it makes if the additional cost of one more transcript is or the additional effort of creating one additional transcript. For instance, if you're going to print one transcript or if you're going to print ten transcripts, if the only additional cost is the cost of the paper, then maybe the, the fourth transcript or, you know, the first transcript should be the most expensive transcript and then every transcript after that should be less expensive. But I, I just, once you, you know, you give three free transcripts and now what? You're charging four dollars for printing one more piece of paper. It just seems in an era where you're really trying to get kids to apply to college, that just seems like one additional hurdle that's I'd rather be pulling the money from somewhere else. That William? I was just gonna say on the parking, um, I think it, it many students don't believe that you really have to pay for parking here. Um, and I've heard that from many, many, many students. There's some messaging there. We don't need really to do. have to pay. No, we, we need to do some messaging. Only the you know the kids that don't know what they're doing pay. Um, so maybe we should look at that to figure out how we encourage students to pay. If I mean, yeah, students to pay. Maybe if that's a sticker, or I don't know if a sticker is issued now. Or, no, they still issue stickers. Um, it's it's a matter of of making it well known that that's an expectation. Okay. Um, and then maybe and I, a faculty sticker, so then everyone would have a sticker, or an employee sticker, so then every car out there would possibly, or I know in other districts in the South where I grew up, students or seniors could own their parking space and like <laughs> paint them for the year. So maybe that would be like, you know, a higher fee if you wanted to have a space for your senior year. I don't know. I would yeah. just, wow. 
I mean, look at that. A lot of schools do that. So, uh, so uh, having sat in, in the role of guidance office secretary, I can say that it's not a simple matter of printing out many more. The requests come in uh, staggered over the course of the semester, and it's a big job to manage that. <laughs> so, and then the other piece of information I'd like to share is that a lot of schools, or I don't know how many, but there are schools that allow students to self-report using unofficial transcripts, and then just once the application has been accepted, they ask for the student to submit an official transcript. So there's, there's functional parts of that that we could look into if that's our concern. I'm wondering if the um, income from uh, printing or mailing or generating transcripts of whatever form, does that make a significant dent in the, I don't know if it's an annual licensing for Naviance or whatever, is it, I mean, is it, yeah, it's it, not a trivial, trivial amount of money that? No, it probably get. covers about half. Mm -hmm. um, the software annually is probably, I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I looked at it and they changed which program they were using oh. in the last year or so. Um, yeah, I think that it, the software is in the, f the annual fee is in the, I wanna say the $4,500 range and this probably generates a couple thousand to offset. All right. Any further discussion before we move to our vote? Excellent, Tillman. Aye. Deb. Aye. Bridget. No. <laughs> Uh, Sarah? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. William? Aye. Anna? No. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Irv? Abstain. And Sarah Bass? Aye. Six, two, one. The motion passes. Okay. Right. Student activities. Student activities. Yeah, the, the, the short story on this is that we've, we've known we've had some accounts that have uh, some, well, I should say, some uh, organizations that, again, over the course of the, the pandemic and, and recent years have, have gone dormant, um, but the students have, uh, have done some fundraising at some point and there is residual money left. So the key thing to keep in mind about student activities, um, while you guys occasionally have to transfer funds, and that's basically switching them from savings to checking, and we have you know, rules around that, but that's really, it's, it's just the authority to move the money. The actual money itself is, is student raised for student purposes. Um, so this isn't money that, that, that in a lot of ways we have much control over, to be honest. It's for the students and for their use. Um, they can choose to do things with student activities money. You know, they can buy t-shirts for the group or they can um, uh, donate to charities. Sometimes they'll do that. Um, they'll go on field trips. There's things that they do, um, but you, you give authority for them to, um, to raise money uh, once they raise it, then how they spend it is, is their choice. Um, <clears throat> but we do have inactive clubs. We actually, it was, we've been talking about this with, with um, you know, internally a little bit and saying, oh, we know we haven't got, done a, a good deep cleanup of a few of these that we know have set for a little bit. Uh, and we were doing a little research and we realized we had actual formal policy on this. Um, and so what we need to do at the moment is just go through our advisor list and look at those clubs that have gone uh, those clubs and, and organizations that have gone dormant or seem to be at dormant, double check to see that they're not getting ready to reactivate, they might be. Um, so we're in that process presently, um, and then we'll come back to you, uh, let's see, what is this, February, probably in March or early April, and uh, have a formal proposal of, of how much, uh, you know, which clubs, and how much money, um, and sort of, so the, the language here is a little broad. It says any balances in closed accounts will be redistributed proportionally to active student activity accounts. 
there's a number of ways to do things proportionally. Um, so if you have thoughts about that, I mean, one way to do it is, is, is to, you know, you could do it based on how many members are in the club. You could do it based on, um, I don't know, uh, how much money they currently have. You could do it based on any number of, of sort of similar sorts of things. I would lean toward membership because generally, you know, if you're buying something for the club use, um, you know, it's it's often something that benefits all those members, um, which you know, in the classic sense, that would be great. But there are clubs and organizations that we have that a lot of their work is charitable in nature. So that's you know a different sort of motivation for them to 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 raise money and 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 spend that money. Um, so I would you know sort of ask you to offer a suggestion about what you think around that idea. Um, the key thing is it will have to go back to student clubs and for student use. Um, it's it's not a small amount of money. Um, you know, we'll have to check. I, I want to say the last estimate I had was, you know, like 20000 or $30,000. I mean, it's In some, money. yeah, because there's a lot of, you know, there's a number of clubs. They've raised some money. Um, that may be overstating it a little bit. I don't want to, you know, oversell the situation, but, but there are, um, you know, there's, there's some clubs that were pretty active. They did a fair amount of fundraising and, you know, I mean, uh, it's a little different with like the class of, but I'll give you this as an example. So, uh, say the class of 2020, well, the pandemic hit in March, they didn't do prom, they didn't do graduation stuff. They didn't do, so they got to the end of the year and all the stuff they would have spent money on, they didn't, they had a pretty sizable chunk of money remaining which they can then use for you know alumni events and whatnot you know it, it ultimately with class of sort of funds those go to the those actually get turned over to the clubs i mean to the class uh when they when they graduate that's not something that gets retained um uh but you know there are some other uh clubs that have done active stuff were very active maybe did fundraising around trips and that sort of thing that that may have fallen into to uh a quiet status then they might be sitting on you know a thousand dollars which you know oh it's a thousand dollars but you get a you know 10 or 15 and suddenly it's real money right mm -hmm. and so it, it will be a, a non-trivial amount of money i don't know i mean i may have overstated the size i, I and that was a rough estimate so it, it could be less than that but it it you know the the idea of how to redistribute proportionally is is one that requires some some consideration so you know obviously we'll be thinking about that in the business office and and think about how to do that in a way that seems you know somewhat rational and fair, but obviously if you all have opinions about that, please please forward those ideas and we'll we'll consider it. We Maybe a couple different options that we present to you for, for actual execution at that point in time. Any questions? Uh, Anna? I was gonna ask if any of the clubs are currently using fundraising to buy items that might last more than a year. So, you know, a lot of clubs will fundraise to go on a trip or participate in a tournament or you know do something that is kind of like a per person fee based mm -hmm. but there could be like a rocket club that buys rocket materials and shoots a rocket off and that would be more expensive than what you would it would didn't, wouldn't necessarily matter if you had 15 kids or 20 kids because right. they would still just buy the one rocket right and so I'm just wondering how many clubs um, purchase items <laughs> that are sort of like a hard set item and it's not necessary for, for the club that wouldn't necessarily be distributed evenly among all of the members uh, at the same cost yeah there's a there's a few i mean there's you know some of them have equipment so you know the the you know the athletic teams all have a student activity uh uh, account as well. So there's, you know, sort of the boosters that came and talked to us about fun. That's a separate thing altogether. So the clubs, the uh, the athletic programs themselves can do their own fundraising. Uh, and they oftentimes will buy equipment that gets used over multiple years. Um, you know, I mean, this is an overly simplistic thing, but like a chess club could buy chess boards and chess pieces, right? And those don't wear out really fast. Um, you know, and or an AV club might buy, you know, uh, uh, projector. Uh, you know, equipment that, you know, electronic equipment that they keep and, and hold. So it, it's, we'd have to look at the clubs and see. 
there'd be some, I don't know to what extent, and, and it's gonna be kind of hard to, to judge on some, some circumstances. Um, but you know, we can look at that as part and parcel of, of, of what, what kinds of things that they tend to buy. We can look at sort of transactionally what they've done over, the, over recent years and see. Jennifer? I have a question and a suggestion. Do most clubs reliably keep a roster of who their members are and how many members they have? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> because it, it um, whether they really do it diligently or not, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a, a question for the, you know, the advisors of those clubs that are supposed to do that. And there's a couple of reasons why. Because if, if you know, getting back to the college application thing, if you want to put that you're participating in a certain club, you know, they're, we want a certain legitimacy to that, and if mm -hmm. we have ways to, to check that. Um, I don't know offhand, I'd have to check with the sort of uh, uh, staff that work with that more directly on a day-to-day -day basis about how, you know, yeah. how good they do. And I think it depends on the club. Some yeah. of them you know, meet really super regularly and have very tight membership and, 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 uh, and do a lot of particular activities together, and others are less formal that way, so I think it, it may vary a little bit too. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I would only want to base the redistribution of funds on that, on that uh, number of members n number if it's somewhat reliable or reliable for most of the clubs. But so my idea is to take the funds and, for, and take 50% of the funds and distribute that evenly amongst all the clubs and then take the other 50% and distribute it based on membership. Because maybe there's a small club that's having trouble getting off the ground and they could use just like an infusion, a smallish infusion of cash to, yeah, to, to, to generate more members or to get themselves off the ground. I don't know, just, just to, to do a 50-50 thing. Uh, Sarah? Jennifer asked my question, but, um, or I would add that when it comes to membership, if it isn't really all that clear, maybe you just do some rough categories like you know, fewer than 15, 15 to yeah. 50 members, something like that. Yeah. Is there a requirement that the distribution take place over a year interval? Because if it's that much money, perhaps it would make sense to distribute it over a series of years. So I think that, I think the a little bit of the pushback there is that we really, uh, again, we shouldn't hold the money and not have students use it, and and we've held this too long. And this is something that you know, when I went into the the uh, the role of, of finance director, the exiting person said, "Oh, we really need to do a redistribution." And then okay. you know, three months later, pandemic hit. So uh, not to okay. always blame everything on the pandemic, but it's like of things okay. to sort of you know deal with. This wasn't necessarily the most urgent because again, clubs were for a year or so they didn't meet at all. So they all sat quietly at that point, and that also you know, impacted the, the ability for them to, to be uh, reinitiated and that sort of stuff. So that's, a, that's all factors that play into this. But I do think, I think, you know, if we're, if we're redistributing, I think our auditors would be like, well, wait a minute. You, if you're going to redistribute, you should just do it all and then be on a much more regular process of reviewing these and, and determining that. Um, but again, it, it had, the policy has a three-year inactive frame, so that's, you know, that's a pretty long time. Um, uh, so it's, you know, it's a plus minus, I, I, I hear you, and it's, it's a chunk. I mean, I think we'll see what the real number is, and then we can kind of, we can come back to that conversation. We can't, like I said, again, we, we have to um, give it to the students for you. So we can't, so if we hold it back, then it seems like we're holding it for some other purpose. Right. Um, and that's a, that might be of concern. So, so then I would advocate for distributing it along the lines in which it was collected. So if it was collected for prom, then it would make sense to distribute it among, amongst the classes as if there was a way of doing that. If it was collected for athletic purposes, then it would make sense to distribute it amongst athletic teams. Yeah, the, the class money will go to the classes, so they still have ownership to that, so that would be distinct. Um, the, in the athletics, it's, I don't think we've closed any programs, so... Uh, okay. In a while, so I don't think any of those would either. But I think so. It's going to fall amongst you know the other kinds of of clubs and organizations mostly. Okay. Uh, William, I would just suggest maybe you could um, ask the advisors or the clubs to put a um, request in for funds, and then see if 
organizations wouldn't come forward with their requests and then you could grant them, have someone grant them. Uh, Anna and then Sarah. This might not help with the redistribution of funds, but should help going forward. Um, if you, every time a club is created, if you could have them have a policy about if they disband, what should be done with any remaining fin finances <laughs> that are in their account, so that at least you would have some guidance, you know, three years after the club dies and nobody is, is still around, well, our policy says that any remaining funds should do this, then maybe you could follow those instructions. I wonder if it is possible, because I know you want to get the money to, to use. It will be kind of a windfall for all the, I mean, it will be a windfall for all the clubs that exist at the time. Maybe is there is it possible to create a, a student activity, a student group, a club that has a pool of money to make grants to new clubs? because starting a club is <laughs> sometimes hard. I mean, and like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they'd have $1,000 and they could give out 100 bucks, you know. Yeah, I think that, that um, I think our auditors have had a negative uh, <laughs> reaction to that type of funding. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, that, that that's similarly to the sort of the idea of a, of a, of a um, of a request for funds that falls into that same category. There's a certain, um, you know, you start to create criteria and it's like, is it fair, is it not fair? You know, that sort of thing. That's part of why I think it has a proportional aspect to the okay. policy, but um, I can look into some of those questions and see if there's if there's things in the, in the state law around some of that or check with our auditors on some of those questions too. Tell me. I think a simple proportional distribution seems the easiest to implement. It doesn't require any judgment calls. Uh, maybe on the numbers of members or something like that, but it's also easy to explain. So if anybody, if any of the students ask how this was done, if that is explainable in some way, that would be good. All right, one or two more comments, then we'll move on to next. No, okay, great. Uh, math curriculum and block schedule. So and that was a bit more aspirational than I was <laughs> able to get to this week. Um, so I'm sorry. So uh, I will say this about that. I, I, I had some conversations with, with uh, Mary Kyler, our, our, our um, uh, curriculum director, about, about the math curriculum a little bit um, and whether or not, you know, one thing we could do, and I think we'll do this a little later in the spring, uh, is perhaps have, you know, our math department head come and talk about uh, some of the things that they're thinking about around curriculum. Uh, you know. Short story is um, not expecting any real changes to the current structure and status, and that's both of math curriculum, but also of, of the block schedule. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's no, you know, sort of immediate or foreseen changes coming, um, but, I, but I'm happy to sort of connect with them and, 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 uh, and have them come and, and talk to us a little bit about what that, what that current uh, structure and thinking is and, and where we are with, with our uh, with our math curriculum at the secondary level. Um, but I also wanted if, is to ask the committee, um, cause this was a topic that came up and, and I think someone you specifically asked and, and I think I've lost the thread on what some of the key questions were for you. I think some of it was about, um, you know, uh, you know, opportunities for kids and, you know, currently if, if, uh, to get to certain levels of class. And this is not exclusively a math question. This is, sometimes it comes up in world language and that sort of thing. You have to double up, what they call doubling up. Um, um, so that, that's in some ways tied to the block schedule that we currently have allows for that in some ways. Um, but I did want to ask the committee and, and particularly tell me, because I know you brought this before and uh, you know, were there some, some specific things you want to make sure that we, we get back to you on? Yeah, I guess the question was that if there was enough resources committed to math so that sorry. <laughs> I'm not even speaking. Um, that the flexible options, you know, 
you know, more accelerated courses are possible because it wasn't clear that necessarily that was possible and it has nothing to do with the block schedule. I think it was just right. the, the options that exist. Yeah, I think that um, I think the short answer is yeah, uh, is yes. The, the sort of options we have currently um, that in, in, you know, in certain circumstances kids can get to um, a multivariable calculus uh, collegiate course, you know, those still exist. Those are going to continue to exist for, for now. Um, you know, I think there are um, some of the limitations on that will be driven by some of our partners with that. So particularly around the question of multivariable calculus, there's, there's, um, that's primarily done through Amherst College. Um, and so, you know, it's the fact that we have anybody take, a, take that class is dependent upon their, their willingness and, and they continue to be and want to be and, and we have no indication of any change there. Um, but there is, you know, you know, if we suddenly wanted to send 60 kids over there, that they might be like, well, that might be a little more than we can do. But, you know, we're not there either. And, um, and they've been a great partner with us and they want to continue to be a great partner with us. So I, I, I think that what we've been able to do there is, is going to continue in kind of the same fashion it has. So I understand the limitations that we can't control what other institutions do. Um, I think based on my personal experience with my ninth grader, it required a lot of pushing the, dep the math department to allow what they seem to think is an exception to be able to take the preparatory courses so that that would even be possible. And so I think that is part of the conversation that I look forward to. Yeah, and I think that, that some of those questions around um, you know, readiness and preparedness and timing and, and seats available um, are, are are complicated ones and, and ones that I think having the math department head and, and maybe Mary Kiley as our curriculum director talk about is gonna be a little better than me for sure. Um, uh, and and um, so I think, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have them come back and talk to that point because I, I think that, you know, one of the things we did this year and will continue to do is refinement of the process of selection of kids into say eighth grade algebra, um, you know, trying to bring, um, uh, you know, additional sort of, um, and, and perhaps more, I don't want to say more rigor. I, I, I think the way we're approaching it's a, a little different than we have in the past. And I think that, um, we're cognizant of, um, uh, wanting to have kids be in the right level of mathematics. Uh, cause there are times that, um, if you accelerate a kid a little prematurely, it, ultimately backfires in a year or two. Um, and we want to be careful about that. And at the same time, we still want to challenge kids as much as we can and to their, to their level of, of interest. And, and so we're, we're trying to balance those things as we go along. Um, uh, you know, the, there, there is a physical maturity component to being prepared for, you know, which is, is, is a piece of, of being ready to take algebra. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, sort of a quirky aspect of, of, you know, child development, um, that, that is, is fairly well known and not, you know, some kids are, are more ready than others in, in eighth grade. And it's not about how smart a kid is or how willing they are. And that sort of thing that, that, that there are challenges that, that taking algebra poses if they're not quite ready for it. And we want to be meeting the kids right at the right place and, and giving them every opportunity to, have the most success as they go through. Um, so I, you know, but the math folks can talk much more specifically to that. Bridget? So I agree, I'd love to hear from the math folks. I think that what I really want to us to be careful of is that that particular circumstance in eighth grade doesn't um, slow someone down from being able to take calculus in high school, especially because that's a pathway into the sciences and then starts to exclude groups of kids and, you know, in the school. So I just love to see like what the ways are because I had a similar experience to Tillman. And um, what I would say is that if Tillman and I experienced that, there's probably plenty of families who aren't as well, in my case, is pushy, <laughs> you know. Um, That's okay. 
And then the second piece is, um, is about AP. Um, just related to the block schedule, what I know is that the AP exams come up at a time of year that then means that people are taking AP are really intense in the fall and light in the spring. Or therefore, that might be just a senior issue, but it's an issue that was on my radar this year. And so, um, you know, how does AP play into all that as well? Sure. Uh, Sarah? I, I asked for the block schedule to be put on the agenda. I may not be the only one who wanted that. So um, what I'm hoping the committee can hear at some point is if there has not yet been a formal review of how effective it has been for student learning, um, I would like us to undertake that because, you know, and it's not just in my own family's experience. I've, you know, I've heard good and bad from other families that the block schedule um, may work really well for some subjects and maybe for some kids, but for other subjects, um, it's not working very well because it may be almost a year between your, you know, two French courses or whatever, or math or your two math courses and that there's a certainly a big opportunity for learning loss um, even though the block schedule may enable a, a lot of learning when it's happening then there's also a big gap so I don't know if there's been any review um, you know asking students or families or even kids who've graduated what they what they made of it um, but I, I think we should examine it. Uh, Anna? I, I wanted to know a little bit more about the current math curriculum. So full disclosure, I just had a conversation with Steve Sullivan <laughs> who had a lot of things to say. <laughs> um, is it still the same, mostly the, the, the material for the math that's being taught is mostly online and not in books anymore? It's, is that the curriculum that is still being used or have people graduated or moved away from that particular curriculum? I was like, I, P, I, I, P? I, no, I, I can't remember what he was calling it, but he said that he was really happy to get it for COVID, but then he realized that it was a terrible curriculum. So, <laughs> so my question is, is it the same curriculum that he was unhappy with or is it a different curriculum that they are now using? No, the, that curriculum has changed. I think okay. the one you're talking about is IMP. It was yes. called IMP. Yes. That is no yes. longer. Yeah, we we jettisoned we, that one. Yeah, we, okay. we we moved away from that. I think it it was a circumstance where um, there were a variety of factors. I think there were ways in which it worked well and in ways in which it didn't work very well. And as we you know sort of reinvested in looking at that, we were like, yeah, this is there's a different sort of structure to this that might be um, that might work better for more students. And and so in some ways we've. You know, we've got more of a traditional model of it. Um, you know, the sort of delivery of, of curriculum was different under the IMP model. So the structure of how um, topics were brought forward and and taught were were very very different in the IMP structure. But I think sort of holding to curricula was was where it was really difficult for us to do them both well. And so I think that's that among other reasons was was part of it. And I think there were aspects that that were. Um, you know, were difficult and problematic from, from the standpoint of, of, of having IMP. It wasn't, I think there were a lot of students that worked really super well for, and in the totality of sort of delivering math that we thought not enough to, to carry to. So is this, is this discussion a little bit more about um, the tracking and the block schedule as opposed to the specific curriculum that's being taught in the classes themselves? Or are we talking about looking at a whole new set of math curriculum because this one is? No, I don't think there's a, there's a uh, current uh, suggestion to change the curriculum. Okay. So it's much more about, about structure, structure and structure. sequence and timing okay. and how the block schedule plays with, with the choices of courses we have and when you can take them and that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. So um, following up on what Sarah said, my understanding is the block schedule evolved from COVID and not wanting students to circulate as much in the building. And, and there's strengths to not having a drop schedule and students juggling many different classes at the same time. 
what I would like to find out if there's a way of finding out is the implications for learning, um, recognizing that the schedule came about at the same time that COVID did. So you have that part of it built into any analysis that you would do, the two, the two are together. But um, time on learning um, is, is a question that I'd, I'd like investigated because my understanding is that um, in some of the classes they've had to extend the what used to be a, a year-long class into three quarters because of um, difficulty um, continuing covering the same materials at the same level as previously. Um, and then the last part is, you know, we evolved from this trimester system to a semester system because of concerns about interrupted learning and residue from having um, language spread out over two trimesters as well as math. And, you know, now we're in the situation where we have a block schedule because of a health situation that I don't believe is is the reason we're doing it now so I'd be interested in understanding how the block schedule fits in with the semester fits in with the reasons why we left the trimester trimester system in, in the first place I know that's a lot but um, I'm really concerned as Sarah is with some kind of continuity in students not necessarily having to read and write every semester, as well as do math. My, my particular student has had these odd schedules where her science and math are one semester and her social studies and English are a different semester. And that's it, this is the second year this has happened. And um, I wonder if other students have had these kinds of learning implications as well. Yeah, we can certainly have them, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Certainly happy to ask the, the high school staff to come back and talk about it and talk about the implications. Uh, you know, the, the, I think the rationale for going to the, to, to the block schedule um, was partly to create more elective choices, um, and it's really expanded the opportunity for kids to get some other things in. Um, I don't know how much the, I don't recall the sort of pandemic influencing it. As, I mean, it may have been a, yeah. oh, and the additional benefit is, but I don't think that was necessarily a rationale for it at all, but it, maybe it was, I don't know. I would have to you know, defer to, to the folks that were um, kind of presenting that. But I think that, yeah, the, the questions of time on learning and sort of gaps in semesters and some of that, and, and you know, uh, are certainly ones that are, are fair questions to ask and, and we can post those and, and have people come in and talk to those a little bit, for sure. Thank you. Irv, did you still have your hand up? I, I just wanted to, come back to um, algebra in eighth grade. Uh, algebra is a gateway math course. And if you, and if it's, and, and the thing that I've had, um, I've heard over the years and still here, is that there is an incredible disparity in the amount of, uh, and, the, and the number of kids who are either low income or kids of color who take that um, uh, algebra and therefore uh, are not able to go on to the higher level of math uh, beyond that. And so the question I have is, you know, Doug is, you know, has, I know that that question has come up. I know that it has been an issue for some time. Uh, and, uh, and, and yet um, we still have this eighth grade uh, math conundrum. And I, I'm wondering, if there has been any discussion in terms of how that uh, ha has been solved or not solved in its relationship to uh, the uh, dearth of, of uh, minority and low income kids going, going to higher level of mathematics. Yeah, <clears throat> I know that that um, a few years ago there was some, some uh, particular coursework uh, I believe at the middle school where they were trying to address that specifically. I don't, I don't know at this point sort of what um, what options or actions are currently in place. So I'll have to I'll have to ask and get back to you on that um, to see and whether or not 
you know, how great those disparities are is one question, but then also what are the sort of, you know, uh, intervening and intervening and intermediate inter, uh, uh, Yes, thank you. Inter <laughs> intervening <laughs> steps we're trying to take to, to adjust that. The other thing I'll say is that if you take, uh, it is possible if you take algebra in ninth grade uh, to get to calculus, you won't get to multivariable calculus, which is a, a college course, but you can get to calculus. It is not um, easy. It does require some doubling up to get there, um, but it's still possible. Um, there are some districts that have gone away from eighth grade algebra because it, it is fraught with some you know, complications, but I'm not saying we should do that or not do that. I'm not gonna go there um, by any stretch, but I think that, that um, you know, as far as uh, preparedness for college and, be, and to do a, 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 a STEM career, um, even if you start algebra in ninth grade, you're, you can get to a level of mathematics that prepares you for collegiate work and even in an engineering or, or, or a science field um, would be my opinion about that. Um, you know, I think that, you know, um, There may be varying opinions about that, and that, that's fine too. And and I think that you know that'll be again where we're having our 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 math department head kind of walk through that a little bit and talk about what's involved. And um, you know, we offer two AP classes in calculus and one in statistics um, that are all part of that mix. Um, so I you know don't want to. Uh, Partly it's about making sure people are aware of the, the range of opportunities for folks if, if they choose that direction and, and ways to get there. We'll talk with, with a department head about, about the options and how to pursue those different uh, avenues. Tell me. No, you're good. I'll okay. defer. Anna? I'm just wondering if there might be some classes that just are not meant for a block style program and that other classes are very good for them, and if there could be some kind of a design that would allow certain classes not to be as blocked. Mm -hmm. at, for, and I'm specifically thinking about languages, which I can't even understand how you teach a language part of the year. Like, it doesn't make any sense. And I understand that kids right now are taking half a year of a language in middle school, and then they spend a summer and a, another semester not taking the language, and they're supposed to then remember all of the stuff that they learned the previous semester, and I can tell you they don't. <laughs> and it, you, you've almost thrown away several months of learning of that language to get them back up to speed to start learning stuff that they haven't yet covered previously. Right. And you know, when you go to college and you take a language, you don't take a language part-time. You take it every day for the whole semester, and then you, if you're going to keep do, going on the language, you take it the next semester. You don't say, well, I'll wait until next year to take the next course. You, do, you don't do that. It, just, it, it sequences, so you're continually taking the language. And to, to not take a language for any period of time, just you lose, every, you lose a lot. You lose a lot. And so it, to me, it doesn't make sense to take a language for part of the year. And so I, I would guess that there are other classes. I mean, I math. think math is a tough one to drop and then come back to, but there are definitely some classes that are more sensitive the, to these kinds of things. And there's, you know, some of these classes, these exploratory classes where you're just, I wanna take one semester's worth and then I'm done taking that class. I don't have to continue taking that class three or four more times, but I just wanted an introduction to this idea. This was really interesting. I had a lot of fun doing it and then maybe I can explore it more on my own, but for something like languages and maybe math, it might need a little bit more consistency across the year. Mm -hmm. okay. Any final questions before we move on? Excellent. Uh, oh, I lost it. I think we're just up to the superintendent's update. I think we've done everything else, right? Okay. <laughs> I'll be brief. <clears throat> um, so uh, a quick update on, on our, our Corian fingerprinting. Um, 
we are down to, if you remove the folks who are on leave, who are a little hard to get hold of because they're on leave, um, there's two people who have quarries that we need to get. And uh, fingerprinting is a little more involved. You have to schedule an appointment, et cetera, et cetera. We've got, um, Thirteen, so that's a much much better place. And so I I'm, I will cycle back with with our with our HR department. So those maybe new folks, you know. So it's a it's an ongoing process of new people coming in and, and attending to that. So that's just a quick update on where that sets. Uh, this morning I was fortunate enough the the um, Amherst College, uh, the president of the Amherst College, invited uh, local um, uh, political leaders and folks like myself to to uh, come to a little. Uh, get together, uh, sort of meet and greet a circumstance to to uh, to uh, connect with the college. Uh, there are a number of ways in which the college interacts with our schools, um, and you know they're interested and curious and wanting to be uh, engaged with us more. And so we're happy to do that. We're going to continue to do that. We've got a number of ways um, that that they uh, provide different kinds of supports and opportunities. I mean, we talked a little bit about you know multivariable calculus, but there are other many other ways in which they they interact. Um, and they also interact with the town of Amherst, and, and they want to be partners with us. So that was a nice uh, event at the Mead Art Museum. Matter of fact, there's a portraits, uh, a project they did with, I think, the Wildwood School with first graders and portraits that is still up. I, didn't, I only could stay for a few minutes, so I didn't get a chance to peek at those, but I, I think I saw some pictures. They're phenomenal. Um, let's see, what else did I want to share with you? Uh, the one other thing I'll share with you is, is there are, you know, uh, uh, as you all know, a number of, of searches going on uh, for for folks that to work for us, uh, which you're a part of. But there's also other things that are of uh, uh, a project-based nature. So there's uh, the Student Opportunity Act, uh, in which the state has um, dedicated some additional resources to some some higher needs districts. Um, but nonetheless, they ask all the districts to fill out a, a Student Opportunity Act plan, uh, and ours is is uh, is due this spring. Um, and so uh, we'll be compiling that over the next you know, few weeks. Uh, technically, it has to be to them by the 1st of April, and it has to be approved by the school committee before that. So that will be coming uh, to you guys over the, over the ensuing weeks. Uh, so uh, just giving you a heads up that there will be this, this plan that we have to put together for the, for the state in that regard. Um, and there are obviously a number of other things in, in uh, region as well as the others that are you know, of high interest to people. So as we've noted in the, in the newsletter, we'll continue to note to keep an eye out for those things that are changing and impacting um, both the uh, elementary schools as well as the secondary schools. So I just want to give you a heads up that that's, that's coming. Uh, and I think that's the main things I wanted to share with you at the moment. And I'm happy to answer any questions people have about other things. Uh, Jennifer? Can you give us an update on the um, SLR meeting regarding the track and field project? Sure. Yeah, SLR is the design company that's working with us on the track and fields. Um, so we had a kickoff meeting. We talked to, uh, about some initial timelines and stuff. As a matter of fact, if you're uh, – so one of the first things to do is to uh, assess the current circumstances in the culverted Tan Brook. Um, so the town of Amherst has a remote camera that they put into s smaller sewer lines. Um, so they're looking at – they're actually going to get a demonstration of a, of a different piece of equipment. And so – um, it's an opportunity to sort of lean on that demonstration to, to get a little bit of a, a glance into that, into that culvert. So that's, uh, those folks will actually be on campus the 13th. So, you know, if you drive by school that day, there might be people in the middle of the fields, you know, wandering around uh, that, would, that don't look like students, and that's part of why. Um, so that, that's getting started. I think that, that um, you know, I talked to them about uh, – one of the critical pieces we need is for them to review the the last sort of uh, financial estimates of, of the different things. They're going to bring that to us as, as soon as they can. Uh, it's pretty critical that we get a, a, an updated and, and more full understanding of, of, you know, sort of broadly where these different options would, would land cost-wise. Um, uh, and so that'll probably over the next couple of months come to us. Uh, maybe as long as three. I don't want to, you know, overstate it. But between two and three, and it's already been another. It's been a week or so since we met with them. So they're they're getting started on that. Um, what else did I want to share with you about that? Um, 
Yeah, there'll be, there will be some decisions around, uh, around the project that, that will be needed uh, because it'll dictate some of the preparatory work that they do for permitting and some of that. Um, so that's that's going to be a, a, a point where there's going to be an opportunity for you guys to weigh in, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and I think that, you know... Um, Why? Why down? Sarah Best, can you mute? Oh. I can... Yep. You can try. I can try. I, think, I, I, I cannot. I think I Kate was yelling at her anymore. dog, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I can do nothing now. Oh, she's gone. There, it came, it came back. It's a terrible computer day. Yeah. <laughs> You're, you're, you're good. She, well, I think she, she I think she exited. She left. That's okay. <laughs> it's all right. It was um, uh, so. Needless to say, there's there's uh, you know uh, a few things that are going to come to you guys. I think a conversation about uh, once we have updated <laughs> updated estimates for for sort of the the neighborhood of the price for some of these. It, it's going to be um, you know sort of the the time that you know. Uh, decisions will start to need to be made and I think you know evaluating once you have that you can also have some of those conversations about materials of surfaces and total cost of ownership and all sorts of other things that you might want to have so I think that's really in that two to three month window we'll start to, to kind of dig into those a little bit and and um, uh, as part of the of the base contract we do have uh, a couple of public meetings scheduled for SLR to 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 uh, participate with the public so we can uh, think about how to do that um, as far as, you know, getting some, some information from them, but also them, you know, hearing from the community. Uh, Sarah? Can you confirm or maybe tell us when the Four Towns meeting is? Yes. So, um, so we're going to have a Four Towns meeting on the 17th. You know, we often will avoid the, the vacation week. That's the first Saturday of the vacation week. To meet sooner would have been too soon. We wouldn't have um, kind of a necessary level of information, uh, but I didn't want to meet on the back end of it because that's a little too close to your hearing, which is on the 27th. So mm -hmm. um, we'll have that meeting on the on the 17th and uh, and hear again from each of the four towns about you know some of the sort of revenue aspect of things, but also you know um, we'll we'll have you know some refined. Uh, numbers and, and some broad categories of, of how we're going to, you know, have expenses and, and revenue sort of line up. Um, we'll be very broad, more broad than we will be on the 27th. Um, and even with that, I will say at that public hearing, there's, there's some specificity that we won't get into just because it's still early and we want to hear from people. I mean, it'll be enough to, to provide comment and, and, and um, feedback um, and for the public to do the same and, and then you know, when we come to, to actually vote the budget, it'll be a little more, uh, a little more specific at that point. Um, but we don't want to, you know, sort of panic <laughs> folks unnecessarily uh, that work for us because, you know, there's ideas that may not, you know, right. that, that we may be exploring that, you know, you as a committee and the public, you know, say, absolutely not, you've got to find something else. And that's part of that process. So we're going to try to strike a balance of trying to give you enough information to, you know, have those conversations and, 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 at the same time, not be too too specific at that point either to you know cause any overly um, high concern. Do you expect that to be a virtual meeting? The uh, yes, or the four towns meeting will be a virtual meeting. Yeah, that's any idea. I, I, I the sooner I know when the better because we've already s scheduling one super. It's in our calendars already. It's nine oh, okay. to eleven on the seventeenth. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. A time also. <laughs> yeah, nine to yeah. eleven. Yep. Deb, yeah. Yeah. Debbie yeah. should have sent it to you. Yeah. Typically nine to eleven is the Saturdays at nine to eleven is the sort of standard time of day and day of week for for four towns meetings. We are having one uh, in February. We don't always have one in in the spring, but we'll do that. And and um, and I don't want to presume. Uh, you know, whether we would have a third, I think, depends on some of how that conversation goes and and whatever else we decide. You know, determine in the meantime. I. I'm hopeful that we'll we'll be at a place of of common understanding at least and see where we're at. But we'll see how it goes. I mean, that's part of why we get together. I had two questions. One is I learned that the CPR application deadline is a lot later than we thought it was, and some of them are still open. I think Leverett is closed. Closed. Mm -hmm. I you checked on those. The CPA. Oh. Yeah. So there. So uh, 
they're coming Let me see up if I can really remember soon, that. but no, the, the thing is, so uh, I'll, I'll suggest two things relative to that. So uh, one deadline was the 5th, one yeah. deadline was the 31st in Pelham, uh, and one deadline was October 1st, um, last fall. And then Amherst is I, November, December, somewhere in the, in the early part of the day. The, the, one of the difficulties as far as a CPA project at this point is, uh, and this came up in, in conversations previously when I went to the CPA, is, um, and this is not the entirety of, of questions that got raised, but one of the questions is like, what are we buying, right? And so without a design, I think we're in a place where it's, it's pretty difficult to ask. Um, the, um, so I think we, we wouldn't have been able to, to put something together unless we rehashed something we had before. But, but even so, I think they would have asked the same questions. I think there would have been the still a level of trepidation on those CPA committees to, to move forward with this, you know, because they're like, well, what are we committing to or not committing to? I think there was, you know, understandably some concern around that. So I think we're, it's, it is a chicken and egg situation around this because we're trying to put together funds from a variety of sources. And, and, and I also understand the, the difficulty each of the communities has around, you know, sort of funding these things with, uh, with open questions. So it's, it's kind of this vicious sort of, well, if we had this one, we could do this. And if we had that, we can do this, you know, so it's, I, I it, it's a, it's an awkward place, but, but I think the last deadline did, didn't pass on the fifth on Monday. So th the second question was clearly we're not going to ask them SLR to design something that we can't afford. So we will, how much of a design can they produce without knowing all of the components? Like, clearly, for a, for a certain, we'll get a rough estimate of what they can do to just resurface the track. And then we'll get a, a rough estimate to just, just turn it. And then we'll get a rough estimate to turn it and expand it. And then we'll also get a rough estimate to replace the interior with turf is that the four different options that we're currently looking at them giving us rough estimates for and then like I, I don't what I what I really don't want to do is spend a whole bunch of money asking them to, to design a field and then realize that it's a million dollars over budget and there's no way we're going to be able to afford it and then we have to go back and have them redesign something else so I, I want to know like how we can best instruct them on what they need to design for us. So, <clears throat> so as far as the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I get it. So the, there's really three things they're going to look at. Replace the track where it exists now. There'll be, you know, um, there will be reorient the track with a natural grass interior and reorient the track with an artificial surface interior. Those will be the three that they, they will, you know, sort of revisit the numbers that Weston and Sampson did, you know, adjust for inflation in certain areas, some aspects of what they call, this is what they call horizontal construction. Some of those things have gone up um, noticeably. Some things not as much. Some things have come down in price. It's been very volatile over the last couple of years. It's settling now. So I think that actually there'll be some, some level of, of, um, I don't want to say comfort, um, but uh, confidence. confidence, perhaps, in, in those numbers staying fairly steady over the course of, of the year or so. Um, but I do think what will, uh, what you as, a, as an organization, will, as a body will need to do is, is make some decisions sooner than, I, I think, in the authorization you give yourself to like November. You're probably going to have to make a decision before November. That's a short story. And, and partly because... Yeah, we can't ask them to design three. I mean, they'll, they'll be happy to do it, but they're going to charge us for it, right? And so it's not money well spent. Um, but also, um, it, it, it dictates, uh, you know, some of their design work, uh, you know, which choices. So I think that when we have those estimates, we'll be, um, you know, they won't be to the dollar, you know, of what we're going to exactly cost. But it's going to be close enough that we'll be able to tell. Um, and, and I think you guys are going to have to make a determination. Um, you know, uh, I forget how you phrased it in the authorization, but uh, sufficient funds exist, I think is the yeah. term, um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and what risk you have. You Let's know, see. the thing is we can't, you know, we could, we could make a determination that 
this, you know, X is going to be the thing that we have them design, and they'll design that. Um, you can't enter contracts with construction folks if you don't have, you know, sort of money of either authorized or available. So, you know, that's, you know, if, if we're unsure of exactly whether we have all the money or not, the risk is that, you know, you spend money on design that you can't design, that you can't build. So that's the, that's the decision you guys are going to have to make in, in the process. And, and, uh, you know, you want to, like I said, I think you're going to have to make that decision, um, earlier than November, you know, and we'll, and that'll be part of the, you know, some of the, the information that they can provide us is what are the sort of really important, you know, deadlines they have in order to do their work, uh, and be on time and, and, and keep the project moving and are critical to the choices that they're going to need to make and, and implement, you know, the components that they implement in the, in the, in the, in the project. So. John? Back to the budget. Have you heard back from Amherst if they're willing to go higher than their currently projected 3% increase over last year's budget? So I have chatted with them a little bit about that, and, and they're actually, um, to that point, they're, they're looking to schedule a, um, a budget coordinating group meeting um, next week, which is where the Amherst School Committee members that are on the budget coordinating group can, can engage in that conversation to some extent. I mean, I think that they're still working through, you know, given the governor's budget came out, they're going to go through, we got our, we got our um, uh, more precise number for our, Health insurance, it's 9.74% as opposed to 10 or 12. Um, so, you know, they're, they're working through the, the math on that right now. They're not all the way through that. Um, so no firm answers one way or the other. Um, but I think that, that um, how Amherst might approach that question. Uh, you know, I've given them the, the, like, the fact that it's going to come and that they need to be prepared to, to answer that question and and have that conversation with the other communities in the in the regional uh four towns meeting as part of where we're gonna have that and and so they're gonna try to you know have some of those conversations to be prepared for that meeting i wouldn't say they'll have a clear like definitive this or that but you know i want them to be prepared to answer that question thank you yeah, so I have a question on the um, Title IX and Title IX investigation we had recently. Was there a hearing um, about that after we were given the reports? So, do you mean the, the Title IX investigations that happened over the course of the summer? I mean, Correct. the spring the one, and summer. The, the reports that we were just released recently. Right. Um, was there a hearing after those reports were released? <coughs> what hearing? No. Okay. No, no, no. So the, the timeline process doesn't have a hearing per se. Okay. So there's, there's you know, an initial investigation. So there's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, notification to the, to the uh, respondent. There's a claimant or respondent claimant. Uh, respondents, the person or persons that are, are identified as perhaps having violated Title IX. Um, you know, there's an initial investigation. They can respond to that. There's a final investigative report. And then there's a, a, a letter called, a, you know, a letter of determination. Um, and that's a determination of, of did they or did they not violate uh, Title IX. You know, disciplinary action from an employment standpoint comes after and separate from that. Um, uh, so, you know, final reports that, that have been uh, made public are exactly that final and any sort of... Um, uh, uh, employment decisions have been made subsequent to that, 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 that that would have informed those decisions but would have been separate from that. So was there a responsibility determination letter that was issued on this Title IX? Yes, there okay. were, well, there were technically three Title IX reports. Okay. And then who made the responsibility determination of if there was a Title IX uh, infringement or not on the students that brought these? So technically it's the principal, um, but we work closely with council because it is technically a legal decision. So we work closely with our council about reviewing that and, and the criteria that are involved with Title IX. Um, so it it has components of it, um, you know, the parallel I'll draw is, is to this, you know, the sort of 
state legal definition of bullying has a you know some components like persistent and repeated as part of the language, um, and and the title line in a, it looks, I forget the particular sorry because I haven't thought about it in in a couple months but it has some of those same kinds of things so there are aspects that that may be. Um, and, and that's the tricky thing with, with I would suggest, in, in getting to that sort of legal definition. And there will be varying opinions. You ask a couple of different lawyers, they might give you different answers to that question. Um, um, but the, um, but there's, you know, sort of, was it a, you know, a title line infraction from the standpoint of just, you know, a harassment or, yes, was it, did it meet the other criteria? Maybe, maybe not. So there can be, these sort of circumstances that seem like in sort of plain spoken ways that it, it would be, and yet sort of technically from a legal standpoint, it doesn't meet the, the criteria. So I just say that as a, as a, a bit of context around these. Um, and then whether, whether or not I can share those, those I don't know. I think um, I'd have to check on whether it, it's considered personal Can you record. comment if there was any Title IX infractions found? Um, I'm going to check with counsel on that. I don't want to, I don't want to get out in a space that, that okay. puts us in a vulnerable place. And it's not that I don't really want to answer the question, but I think that, that I want to check on what our responsibility is as far as, uh, you know, personal records and, and that sort of thing. So the reports but, that we were made published was not the conclusion of this process of Title IX. There was more no. after that. No, there was another, okay. another step. Is the process there. complete now, or is it still yes. ongoing? No, those are done. Okay. Um, and it's, I, I guess I have a question. If Was this Title IX investigation filed uh, through the district? Was it filed through the state or through the federal government? And is that why the principal then is the ultimate one who decides if there was an infraction or not, and not someone that's outside of the school district? Um. <clears throat> No, it's filed in the district. Um, so and it was so, not filed in the federal government, which it could have been done. I presume it could have, yeah. Okay. Uh, Irv? Wow, I almost forgot what I wanted to say. Um, but I wanted to come, uh, Doug, you mentioned that the BCG was going to be meeting in a couple of weeks. The uh, information that uh, I received back on, and, and the other person, Bridget, I believe, who's on the BCG, was that the next meeting was, was not going to be until March. I think that's what they were thinking originally. I, I literally had a, a, a brief conversation with the town manager and, and, and the chair of the finance committee today, and so I think that that may change. I know that uh, they'd like to meet next week in anticipation of, of the, the 17th which is when the four towns are meeting, but I also know that the Amherst School Committee is meeting on the 13th and the 15th, so that's gonna limit the possibilities. But um, yeah, you should probably, you know, the invite to that or questions about availability will probably come really, really soon. I guess I was confused by the conversation about the Title IX reports because I thought that Attorney Mitnick determined in two of the three Title IX reports that there was a violation of Title IX. I thought that in, in, in of the three Title IX reports, one, Mr. Mitnick determined there was not a violation and the other two determined that there was a violation. So I was also the, under the impression that that was, that was the determination and that the principal then determined the out, like the, the consequences. I didn't realize that there was another decision to be made as to whether, uh, the title, the, whether the law had been violated. Yes, there is an, in this additional step. It's called the, you know, the, the determination of responsibility. And that's, that's, you know, technically holds the weight of a legal decision. And it is, it, it is, I will say personally, I think it's a little strange in some ways that it holds that weight. And that's part of why we, we lean so heavily on counsel because it does require that, um, that sort of lens relative to the components that, that are um, a part of determining Title IX. So it's, there's, 
there's, you know, sort of the common definition of Title IX from the standpoint of like, and I don't want to give an example, but anyway, of the thing you think of, uh, human beings think of as, you know, in sort of plain sense of the, of the, uh, the term, and then there's this sort of component pieces of an actual legal determination, sort of like, you know, any other sort of, you know, legal proceeding. Um, you know, there, there are sort of component pieces that, you know, qualify as, you know, like there's, you know, technically certain components of what form a contract, right? And if you talk to lawyers, it's you need X, Y, and Z, right? And it does, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be written and it doesn't necessarily, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there's similar kinds of component pieces to uh, that responsibility determination step, which is the final, you know, uh, final determination. Um, uh, and it, you know, again, it's, it's, it, it can be distinct from um, what the, the report said. Because again, the report's determining whether or not the infractions happened. You know, did this behavior happen or did it not happen? Which is different than was it meeting the legal requirement of, of, a, of a Title IX violation. Okay, I, thank you for that information. Um, you did at one point confirm to us that three employee terminations had been completed as a result of the Title IX reports. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thanks. So, as I said, you know, there's the responsibility of termination, but that's a piece in the in the sort of aspect of how we, as a as a as a uh, as an employer, would evaluate. Um, you know, employment, discipline, and decisions. Point of order. Yep. Two and a half hours have passed. Okay. Jennifer? I move we extend our meeting by 15 minutes. Second. Uh, Tillman. No. No. Bridget? Yes. Do we have a discussion Sarah? first? What is, is there anything left on the agenda? I don't think so. Future agenda planning. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, yes. Jennifer? Yes. William? Yes. Anna? Yes. Irv? Under ordinary circumstances, I would vote no, but having only one agenda item left, I'm going to vote yes. <laughs> and Sarah Bass, I will vote no. Uh, so we are extended by 15 minutes at a vote of six to three to zero. We are extended for 15 minutes. Uh, Bridget? I just had um, a question, I actually had two questions for the superintendent about the um, update. The first one is just, what is the procedure now for um, students who have reports of concerns about staff? Is that, con is that policy consistent across all the schools? And who's responsible for overseeing it at central office? So the short answer is yes, uh, in a, and I think that that if if students have uh, concern about staff, there's obviously the first order of business for any kid that that would have that is to go to a trusted adult and, and relay that information because, um, again, they you know it may not necessarily be bullying or harassment that they have a circumstance uh, that they're that they're wanting to report, and so that's that's fully within within the uh, the. Uh, uh, Sort of first steps of, of what they should do, um, and and you know it, it may be that something should be done via bullying or or, or harassment uh, reporting, but but it not necessarily. And and even if so, <clears throat> it can still be reported to a trusted adult. Their responsibility at that point is then to 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 go to the to um, you know either a supervisor in the building or to to central office and and bring those those things forward at that point, and then and then that. Uh, engages our HR department and in, in investigation of whether or not it needs, you know, further invest, you know, a deeper and formal sort of investigation of what kind of investigation would happen. Any last comments? 
The second question I had was just um, uh, related to the event this morning and wearing of the purple, which is mm -hmm. I noticed in <laughs> in the budget that um, that the Vela program is noted as zero, and I just wondered, could you give me a status update of what's going on with that program? Is it is that because Amherst College is paying for a dollar? Is it still ongoing? No, the Vela project. <clears throat> It may be that uh, I'd have to look at the, the line in particular. The, the Vela program continues. Uh, what we may be, one of the things we were going to do that we didn't do in creating the budget was we have been in past years sort of putting the entirety of the resources in the, in the um, payroll line when we really should be putting some of it in the payroll line and some of it in the expense line, which is for <clears throat> materials and that sort of thing. We may not have made that switch. We were hoping to do that. So if it says zero in an expense line, which would be like, you know, Vela materials, that sort of thing, and it would be next to other kind of curricular materials, that's uh, the funding's still there. It's just not showing. And and that is a program we've had grants for, but not it's not one that Amherst College has particularly supported. I mean, not, not, not that they wouldn't, but it just hasn't been one that, that they funded in the past. All right, thanks. So I think it's maybe an oversight on how we put the numbers in the budget, but they're, they are there. Okay, It's good, just good. maybe not in the right places in that regard. That's what I was hoping. <laughs> William and then Dan. I just had uh, two quick follow-up questions. Um, do we have somewhere in policy or somewhere that it lays out what the Title IX investigation steps are? Do we have that somewhere? I, think that's I can't law. find it anywhere. I think it's a law. No, no, about how the school handles it. I can check. Okay, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we do. I just okay. I don't. Off and the top then of my, head. my next question is, if you can comment on this, it's my understanding that the responsibility determination letter was issued. Um, if an appeal was requested, was that appeal granted or was that appeal denied? Um, again, I'm going to defer to checking with council on, on whether we can or can't comment relative to that. Um, and I, I just want to remind folks, you know, when we when we're in this section of our of our agenda, we want to be really careful to, to be cognizant of open meeting law and, and sort of topics that are um, on the agenda or not on the agenda because of the ability for, for folks. And, and that's, you know, just a reminder, myself included, I've, you know, been contributing here to this conversation, so I want to be cognizant of that and, and make sure that uh, if we're going to discuss topics, we want to make sure that the public has an opportunity to be here and listen for it and, and be prepared to, um, uh, you know, either provide public comment or, or provide you guys with, with uh, questions later. Uh, did you still have a question, Dan? It was just something that we neglected to put in school committee announcements. So I just... Um, can you wait till next time? No. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So the first meeting of the Title IX Investigative Report Subcommittee is taking place tomorrow, virtually, six to eight. Sorry. No, that's fine. Um, I just, I want to correct that. I believe that meeting is on Thursday, yeah, it's not the tomorrow. 8th. Oh, right. And it's on, it's, um, it's available on Zoom or Google Meet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, future agenda planning. Uh, Jennifer? I have two things. Bullying and harassment update. Thank you. And I have a new thing. So. My request is for someone to come talk to the school committee about what is a 51A and what is the district's practice or process for filing a 51A. And bringing this to how this relates to the school committee's work, the school committee has a policy on reporting child abuse and neglect. It's, pol it's policy JLF, and it was adopted in 1983. So does it need to be updated? How does it relate to our current practice and process? And might the school committees decide to ask the policy subcommittee to review that policy? That, that policy, yes. So, an overview of what is a 51A? How is it? When is it? Just all of that. Yeah. Thank you, Tillman. 24-25 calendar. Yes. People are starting to plan their summers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sarah. Um, at some point, and I'm thinking like during this year, and it might be after the, we have a new superintendent, but I don't, evidently there is no um, school improvement plan for the high school or the middle school. And the, probably the most recent effort was 
I expect derailed by the pandemic, but first of all, I believe we're supposed to have those <laughs> and revise them every five years, and they're supposed to inform our decisions about policy and budget. So um, I think sometime this year we should figure out how to relaunch that process, unless my understanding of it is, is wrong. Anything else? Deb? Track and field subcommittee charge and membership. Did you have a hand up? We, we still we're sort of justice on the agenda setting. In our future agendas, yes. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Anybody want to make a motion? <laughs> I, I move we adjourn. Second. Uh, Tillman? Aye. Deb? Aye. Bridget? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Jennifer? Aye. William? Aye. Anna? Aye. Er? Aye. And Sarah Beth? Aye. We are adjourned at 9.17.